I hope you're all here for computer architecture. Is that good? Cool. This is a good time to be studying computer architecture, as I will hopefully show you. Uh, the website of the course is already up, so if you want to check it. Uh, I don't have it on the slides, but I'll show, them, show it tomorrow. But you can also find it relatively easily by changing uh, last year's uh, website, 2018 to 2019, basically. And you can find all the materials from last year. So this, this year it's going to be a little bit different course, but it, the basics are still going to be the same. Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, so let me introduce myself first. I'm Onur Mutlu. I've been here for four years about now. Uh, and I'm a professor here. Uh, before that, I was at Carnegie Mellon University for some time. I still have some PhD students over there. I go back and forth once in a while, but less so now. Uh, I got my PhD from UT Austin. Uh, I did my thesis on Renhead execution, a way of tolerating long memory latencies. It's a fascinating topic, I think. <laughs> If you're doing a PhD in a topic, you should definitely be excited about it, for sure. <laughs> because it doesn't make sense to spend five, six, seven, eight years of your life on something you're not excited about, I think. Uh, I, I actually uh, uh, did uh, a lot of internships at Intel and AMD while I was a PhD student. And you may see some examples of uh, things that I describe based on those experiences. And when I finished my PhD, I went to Microsoft Research and started the computer architecture group at that time, in 2006, uh, they were very interested in doing computer architecture. And right now, everybody's doing computer architecture, actually. They were a little bit forward-looking, perhaps, at that time. And they started a computer architecture group, and I was the first person over there. And we grew the group, and you will see some of the works that we've done, also, with respect to that. And uh, I worked at Google and VMware and a couple of other companies uh, over the course of my uh, career. Uh, this is the best way to reach me, if you want to send me well, I'm not sure if this is the best way, actually. The best way is really WhatsApp. <laughs> but this one is a bit, uh, a bit better than maybe some other ways. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the phone number later on if you stick around in this course. In my experience, people usually drop after the first course, or the first class or the second class. Maybe they think I'm too hard or something. But this is fun. <laughs> Uh, you can see all of this information from my website. Basically, I do research and teaching in computer architecture, which is why you're here. Uh, computer systems, hardware security, bioinformatics. And I think these are all related to each other. Uh, you will see we'll cover a lot of topics uh, that are related to things that I'm doing research on. Uh, clearly, this is a relatively advanced course, so we're going to cover relatively advanced topics as well. How many of you took uh, the, the digital circuits class with me? Okay. Only two? <laughs> I thought more people were registered, but maybe they're not here. Maybe they know that this is being recorded and <coughs> they're just going to watch the recording. <laughs> uh, has anyone else taken a, another course with me? Okay, probably the seminar course, yes. Uh, I see some <laughs> hands in the back. Okay, so that's good. We have a good mix of people. Uh, Okay, we're going to cover a lot of these. Basically, we're going to talk a lot about memory and storage today. Uh, and not, uh, well, today we're going to talk about memories for, for sure, but uh, during the course also. We're going to look at issues like hardware security, safety, predictability, reliability, fault tolerance, which is important. I mentioned that earlier, right? We're going to see an example of it in a very recent chip very soon, very briefly, not, not, nothing, uh, nothing very special. Uh, we're going to talk about hardware software cooperation, and we're going to talk about specialized architectures for things like bioinformatics, health, medicine, machine learning, which is really the big thing that's going on right now uh, in architecture as well. So uh, we do research in these areas also. Uh, this is actually a slide I used to show to PhD students who are incoming. These are some of the research areas that I work on. This is a busy slide, but uh, you can look at the picture basically. This is essentially what we're going to cover in this course also. A lot of what goes on in a chip, what goes on in the memory side, what goes on in accelerators like graphics units, and what are some upcoming things that are happening in memory and storage, like emerging memory technologies. And I will give you another example. You're, you're actually at a lucky place, I think, in computer architecture, because in 2019, a lot of things happened in computer architecture that have changed a lot of things, as you will see in a little bit. Uh, which was not true in 1999, for example. Yeah, I, will, I will give you an, uh, give you that perspective also. But basically, uh, these are some of the things that we're going to talk about. You don't need to uh, uh, read everything on the slide. Actually, I, one thing I would recommend in following my lectures, it's better uh, not to 
try to read everything on the slides. Slides might have a lot of stuff. Uh, if you try to read them, you will lose what I'm saying. It's better to uh, basically follow what I'm saying and maybe get the key things on the slides, like these pictures, right? The clues. Okay, so we're going to cover a bunch of stuff. So, uh, as, I, as, I, as I promised, I was going to show you uh, several things. Today, uh, many interesting things are actually happening today in computer architecture, which was not happening a long time ago. Uh, certainly when I was studying, uh, doing my undergraduate degree, computer architecture, people were thinking, who cares about this field? Right. But I cared about this field. I, I, I'd like to think that I'm thinking forward. But <laughs> uh, basically, people were, uh, the, the paradigm was, you design uh, processors that are designed uh, uh, for single thread, uh, high performance, out of order, super scalar execution, and that was the only paradigm. People didn't really think about some different memory system. People didn't really, at least, uh, didn't really think as much about uh, parallel computers. Certainly not machine learning accelerators. Machine learning was not even on the table at that time. People didn't care about it. People were thinking this, this wouldn't work. That was 1990s. Today, we're in 2019, and it's a very different place because of the changes that have happened in many, many directions, which we will cover in this course. Things like this are happening right now. This is uh, a memory technology that you can buy today. You can put it on your computer, and it's persistent, meaning it's non-volatile. Today, if you look at DRAM technology, for example, it's volatile. You, you write data to it. Once you lose power, power gets lost. But this thing is there right now. You can buy it, and you can have very fast uh, access to persistent data. Essentially, think of your files being stored in memory like this at very low latency, as opposed to going to the disk for milliseconds. Well, SSDs are microseconds, maybe, OK? Uh, but this is like nanoseconds, on the order of nanoseconds, let's say. Well, if you don't think it's on the order of nanoseconds, it will become in the order of nanoseconds in a few years. So technology improves. This is non-volatile memory. We're going to cover this. Uh, this is called 3DX Point. Intel introduced it this year. Uh, it's it's uh, in, even though Intel, I don't think, admits it still. Uh, it's the technology is really phase change memory as far as we as far as all the indications suggest. Uh, it's not publicly said, but uh, all the indications suggest that it's phase change memory. It's a technology that we will cover. Basically, it's a technology uh, where you store data. Uh, in the form of resistance, which is very different from existing technologies that we have. Uh, well, this is also existing, but uh, the existing technologies that we had, where you store data in the form of charge. You lose charge very quickly, charge gets lost, and you cannot retain charge, in DRAM at least, uh, across power cycles. Whereas in this one, you can retain charge because you've changed the resistance state of the memory uh, from high resistance to low resistance, or low resistance to high resistance, and that's how you encoded the data. And this is non-volatile. This didn't exist last time I was teaching this course. So you guys are lucky, basically, in the end. <laughs> this, is, this exists now. <laughs> and you can buy it, you can experiment with it. There are papers that are being written on it. And we will cover this fundamental technology. So what will this change? This, this basically enables very fast access to storage. So people are using it, for example, very fast boot up of the machines. Uh, people are also proposing mechanisms if you have this non-volatile memory very tightly integrated into uh, your, uh, your processor then maybe your processor doesn't need as much power. Maybe you can, you can be running somewhere uh, with very, very low power uh, uh, where you don't have good access to power in some random place, maybe space, who knows. Uh, and you can run intermittently and you can intermittently store data very quickly to this sort of memory so that you don't lose the computations that you've done. So imagine these sort of applications. These sort of applications can be enabled only by thinking about this technology and uh, thinking about how do you architect the system around it. Okay, that's one example. There, there could be many, many other examples. So once you have this technology, you can imagine many other things. We'll see the uh, underlying details of the technology and how to take advantage of it. But clearly, uh, whenever you think about, uh, whenever you see a technology that I introduce in this course, uh, don't think just, uh, what I, just about what I describe. Because what I describe is limited to what we know today. Uh, but as an architect, as we will see also, you should really think about the future, like 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, and you will have careers much longer than that down the road. What can you, how can you take advantage of this technology? That's how you can really improve things going into the future. The space example is one example. I don't think anybody's using this particular technology in space right now, but it could be used if it's developed in the right direction. Okay, 
Did anybody hear about this before? Yes. Yes, okay. You had a question? Yes. So I know this isn't the focus of what you're trying to get to about sure. this stick, but I know it says 128 gigs. Isn't that a lot more than we typically you know, consider for a stick in memory? Isn't that what? A lot more than. Before. Absolutely. Yeah. So th this is one. Uh, this is one benefit of this technology compared to what you could put on uh, in, a, in a DRAM. Yeah. A DIM, you can put. Uh, you can squeeze a lot more bits inside a chip, and we will. We will cover that because it's a much more scalable technology. You can make the, uh, uh, the memory cells much smaller than you can make them in DRAM, and it's a much more scalable. Also, over time, you can make them even smaller compared to DRAM. So there's a disparity. And we will talk about DRAM quite a bit because DRAM is facing scaling challenges. And this is exactly why uh, the technology was developed. And if, if you, uh, let me give you, uh, since this is the introductory class, but actually in the, in the entire class I would like to make it more interactive going forward. If you have questions, it's best to ask them. Uh, but uh, also think about how long it takes uh, for a technology like this to develop. Did, uh, did you hear about phase change memory before? Did anybody hear about phase change memory before? Yes. Did you know that? Uh, did anybody use CD rewritable CDs before? Or are you all too young for it? I see. Okay. Sometimes when I, I ask this question, I, I figure out that I'm very old <laughs> because people have not used some of the technologies. But CD rewritable CDs, I guess, still are not that bad. So rewritable CDs actually employ phase change memory. Uh, it's this, it's it's a very similar technology, uh, maybe different materials. But uh, it operates based on the same fundamental principles. You store charge based on the resistance of some uh, phase change uh, device. And uh, you, you, I, I'm sorry, you, you, you not store charge. You store data. You encode data based on the resistance of some phase change device. And you read data based on some property of that resistance. In, in rewritable CDs, you shine light on the CD. And the reading process happens optically. So it's really an optical reading process, which is extremely slow because of the optics. Well, in, the, in, that, in this particular case, at least. Uh, so uh, this technology was developed in the 1960s, actually. If you trace it back, it goes even earlier than the uh, 1960s a little bit. And people used it for rewritable CDs. But people were really interested very recently, uh, very recently meaning in the late 2000s, uh, on replacing DRAM with, with, with the technology like phase change memory. But it was not easy to do because you, don't, you, cannot, you cannot have an optical reading process in, in a machine like this, basically, uh, and certainly when you access your main memory. So what, uh, what a lot of research has done was to develop the read device. This is called a read device. Uh, basically, this is the device that enables you to read this technology very fast and reliably. And those read devices were developed over the course of 2000s, let's say, especially Intel and IBM did a lot of work to develop those read devices. And those read devices, once they were developed reliably, they enabled this technology. That's why you're seeing this technology today. And uh, the first architectural works, which we will cover also, uh, we actually did one of the first architectural works in this area in 2009. In, in one of the top conferences, we presented the work. There were three works that were being presented at the same time on using phase change memory uh, uh, as a replacement for DRAM. And remember, remember, that's 2009. And the research, usually when you see a paper that was published in 2009, you can guarantee that the research was done at least a couple of years, for a couple of years before that. Probably more than that, actually. We started doing that in 2007. So this technology came about to reality in 2019. So that's another lesson here. Basically, if you're an architect, you have to be patient. <laughs> you may have a great idea, but for that idea to really come to reality, it's going to take time. Especially if you're working on a new technology that's completely different. Uh, that is dependent on many, many factors, including manufacturing here. Here, people needed to develop the manufacturing capability to actually reliably manufacture uh, those read devices as well as the phase change memory cells. Okay. Have I bored you? No? Okay. Okay, we'll keep going. This is just one example, so I'm already behind what I've scheduled, but that's okay. We're going to take a, <laughs> take a more relaxed view of this course now. Okay, so this is one example. Uh, you're lucky not just because of this, and you can imagine uses of this, but there's another interesting thing that happened uh, this year, which is this chip. How many of you have seen this chip? Okay, multiple. So how do you see this? Did you follow hot chips? No, uh, on the internet. Okay, on the internet, yes. Yeah, well, this is very popular these days because of how it looks like, right? <laughs> Basically, this is... Uh, 
there, there's a huge push for designing uh, machine learning uh, artificial intelligence accelerators today because the data uh, that you have is so much and you need to process it really fast especially to train these machine learning models people are finding that CPUs and GPUs they're not really up to the task even FPGAs I think uh, you really need to specialize uh, the processor that you build so that you can do these computations very fast and very efficiently and you can, put, you can do them, many of them at the same time uh, and this is one solution that uh, a recent startup came up with this is not they manufactured it it hasn't been successful yet that's true for this one also actually even though Intel has manufactured it it, has, it hasn't proven itself yet this chip also has not proven itself yet but there's something different in this chip as you can see this is the largest GPU that you have today and this is uh, you can, this is, uh, you can scale this basically this figure is to scale and the largest GPU is 21 billion transistors 815 square millimeters and this is uh, they call it a wafer scale engine because really they take the whole wafer and essentially cut this wafer into that sort of chip as opposed to cutting the wafer into small chips like what's normally done so it's a very bold move, it's a very bold technology, it's not clear how the reliability uh, will work out because we don't have the numbers yet, but you can see that you have 1.2 trillion transistors. That's a bit crazy, right? Even Moore couldn't predict this probably. <laughs> but uh, you can see the area, right, since you have the entire wafer or a good chunk of the wafer, you get 46,000 square millimeters. That's about 47x the size of this chip. And what this does is basically it does acceleration of machine learning tasks. A lot of matrix multiplications, floating point multiply and additions, and a bunch of other stuff. Of course, they don't disclose exactly what they do, but you can imagine what goes into machine learning training, which we will talk about uh, later on also. And you can see that there are 400,000 cores in this one. So if you're interested, you can look at the links and you can find more information about this as well. But this is also another uh, reason why studying computer architecture is really important today, because Actually, I know that some of these folks who uh, built this chip. Uh, I, I, I worked with some of them during my internship at AMD. Uh, they had the experience to actually think ahead and design something like this. Now, again, we don't know if it will be successful, but this is a very interesting move. If it's successful, it can change the paradigm. Maybe people will start producing wafer scale engines going forward. Who knows? But of course, you should al always think about that thing comes for free. Like this thing is small and it's made small so that it's reliable, but you may have a lot of defects in a, in a huge wafer, right? The question is how do you handle those defects? How do you power up such a huge chip? Like this thing we know how to power today, how do you power up this huge thing? I don't know, uh, well clearly there are some answers, but we don't need to go through them right now. How do you cool down this sort of chip? If you're doing so many computations at the same time, it's going to clearly generate a lot of heat. We don't even have heat sinks. This uh, to, to, to actually uh, take the heat out of this chip today. Okay, that's another example. Any questions? Okay, I'll give you another example. This is again 2019. Uh, this was also introduced in hot chips like the previous one. This is uh, another startup. Again, this, is not, this has not succeeded yet, but people are trying hard. Uh, basically what this is, is it's a processing in DRAM engine. You have this DRAM module uh, what these folks have done is uh, augmented the chip, the memory chip, with essentially processors. They call the data processing units. Uh, it's standard DIMMs, so you can plug it into any computer. But now your computer has capability to do computation inside the memory, which is very interesting. It's a limited amount. It's actually a full processor over here, and they have some instruction set architecture. Uh, you need to write your programs to make sure uh, they work, of course. But the programming part is not that terrible as long as you fit your application uh, to, uh, to, to run on uh, these processors inside the memory. Again, this is something that you could not imagine 20 years ago. 20 years ago, people thought that processing in memory was dead. Even though it's an old idea, we will cover it. People thought it's not an interesting idea because we have processors that are running really well. Right? They're getting the job done. Why change? But today, because we have such a big memory bottleneck, people are looking at solutions like this. Okay, and that, uh, the, the processor inside the chip clearly has a lot of computation, but a huge, uh, a huge amount of memory bandwidth available to it. You can look at the numbers in their presentations. I don't want to pick the numbers because this is, this is still speculative, right? 
But this is happening. People are actually uh, putting, putting processing inside the memory. Okay. Did you know about this one before? Anybody? Okay, this is probably some people know. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at another one. This is another one, maybe not as huge as uh, Cerebras' wafer scale engine, but this is done by a car company, Tesla. Uh, they figure out that our cars would run better if we actually design the cars together with the processors that, that drive them. Essentially, this is their machine learning chip that is supposed to be used in their cars. According to them, it's used. And they have a nice video that's explaining this chip. Uh, you can take a look at it. They, it gives more details than on this slide. Uh, what, what is this? It's essentially another machine learning accelerator, which we will cover also. Uh, you get a lot of transistors on this one also, not as much as the trillion uh, transistors, but still, this is a relatively large chip. And you also have a GPU, pretty reasonable. And you also have a bunch of CPUs inside. So it's a heterogeneous architecture that consists of uh, machine learning accelerators, CPUs, GPUs. And somebody needs to program it so that it can make the Tesla cars run faster. And if you're interested, you can read the, uh, this thing in more detail. Basically, they showed significant performance and energy efficiency improvements compared to a state-of-the-art GPU. Uh, that's, wh uh, that's why they wanted to build it, because they needed a specialized solution and they didn't have that specialized solution. Basically, uh, existing chips are not uh, satisfying the demands of these workloads uh, that we're, we have today. That's true for machine learning, that's true for graph analytics, that's true for genomics, as we will see. That's true for many, many areas where we have lots of data and we need to process data really fast and we need to really make sense of data really fast. And this is one example. That's why these things are happening today. And there's, a, uh, there's, there's a, uh, an interesting thing over here. You can see that there are two of these chips together. They put two of them to ensure that if one of them fails, the other one will continue. The reliability is important. This is a very old idea, actually. It was developed in 1970s. It's called dual modular redundancy. You basically have uh, if, uh, two components that act, to get, uh, that act in unison. And if one fails, you use uh, the other one. Or you basically run two components at the same time and check the results. And if, one of, uh, if, one of them dis if they disagree with each other, then you know that there's a problem somewhere. That's dual modular. Of course, it's expensive, right? But they, they thought this was a good trade-off. Uh, now you have to pay, cost, pay the cost of two chips to get one thing done. Right? Uh, but they thought this was a good trade-off. And if you want to be more reliable, you can go triple modular redundancy. You can have three chips. And if you, you can extend this to n modular redundancy, where n is greater than uh, 1, right? So clearly, uh, uh, reliability is also important. So that's why I think we're in a very complex space today. We want performance, clearly, and we, the way we're getting performances with these specialized chips, we're also getting efficiency with these specialized chips, but we need, pow we need, to, we need ways to power them up. So power is a problem, thermals are a problem, reliability is a clearly a problem over here. And we haven't even talked about security yet. Like, actually, there, uh, if, you, if you watch this video, they talk about security a little bit. But how do you keep these chips secure? Especially uh, if they're doing self-driving, right? If someone hacks into these chips and ensures that you crash or you go somewhere you don't want to go, how do you, how, how do you contract that? It's not easy, basically. And it all needs to go into the hardware because hardware has a lot of security problems as well. I didn't put them over here, but probably most of you heard about Meltdown and Spectre. By now, right? How many people heard about Meltdown and Spectre? Okay, probably most people. That's, that's good. If you haven't, probably search for Meltdown and Spectre and you will see. Okay, so another example. This is relatively old now. Uh, the machine learning accelerators actually started, uh, at least the, the big ones started with uh, this one. This is Google's uh, Tensor Processing Unit, Generation 1. Uh, which was developed around actually 2015, 2016, and the first paper was written in 2017. You can read this paper uh, for more information on it. But they, they thought that this was important to develop because their data centers uh, did a lot of machine learning uh, tasks, and uh, existing processors, CPUs, GPUs, were not enough to the task. And they had a huge amount of computation and uh, and computation in their data centers and they were able to build this chip and uh, I believe it's uh, this is an example of success because it's actually employed uh, as far as I know in all of Google data centers to accelerate machine learning tasks and this is the first generation if you're interested you can read uh, this paper 
And if you take it my course, you've learned about systolic arrays. Basically, the way it operates is really like a systolic array. You can see that there's a, this a matrix multiply unit. Uh, and basically, it's, it's kind of invisible to the software. Software uh, thinks that uh, 256 byte input is read at once, and uh, that, uh, that input updates one location of each of the 256 accumulator RAMs that you have over here. Basically, it does matrix multiplication. Uh, and you can read the paper for how it does matrix multiplication. Uh, actually, I have some more detail in the next few slides. But this is the second generation. They, all, they already have third generation, fourth generation upcoming. So the, the, for example, this one is designed for training as well. So machine learning consists of two things. We train a model. You figure out uh, how you should uh, um, basically train a model based on a lot of data. And you, you later use that model for inferring, for classification, for example. Right. So this chip is designed for training. And usually chips designed for training need to, be, need to have a lot more memory, a lot more computational power, because you're really dealing with a whole lot more data to really build a model. Uh, whereas inference, you can be a lot more efficient, although inference tasks are getting larger as the networks are getting deeper and deeper uh, today. OK, so you can see that uh, memory is also improving in this chip. You know, now they have high bandwidth memory, which is much more higher bandwidth uh, and higher power also compared to DDR3. And they needed more chips. And you can see that uh, they have complete floating point operations and their performance is much higher. So you can see that the requirements, as the requirements go up, the chips are becoming bigger and bigger as well as more and more powerful. And the memory systems need to keep up as well. OK, so this is uh, just to show that basically uh, they're, they're doing systolic computation. This is really an example of a modern systolic array. Uh, I'm not going to go through the slide in, um, in more detail. But there are some interesting th tidbits over here. From a correctness perspective, software is unaware of the systolic nature of the matrix unit. But for performance, it does worry about the latency of the unit. This means that programming this is important so that you can get the, get the best latencies. And this is the larger uh, scale of the system. Basically, you have this matrix multiply unit, but there's a lot of other stuff that you need to add to the host processor to make it work, essentially. Uh, you can see that you need to set up the data, and you need to input it uh, in a regular way so that uh, the data that's coming from here uh, matches the weights that are coming from here. These are the weights of the neural network. Uh, and matrix multiplication is done, and then you get the data back, and then maybe even feed that back in. So you can read this for, uh, in more detail. Any questions? I know this is high level stuff, but this is important stuff <laughs> to, uh, to go over. OK, basically, uh, th today there are many concepts being investigated. And on top of that, not just investigated, but people are building systems uh, with them, like processing in memory. Actually, I didn't put the neuromorphic computing over here. There's a research prototype from Intel. Loihi, for example, that's a uh, that's an example of neuromorphic computing. IBM has a bunch of research prototypes also on that one. Uh, I, I chose the previous ones because these are actually essentially commercial. People, are, people wanted to have these commercialized. And that's why there are startups in it. The other ones, neuromorphic ones, are still, there's still time for them to become more commercial. Uh, but who knows? They may become commercial also. Uh, um, New accelerators, clearly machine learning tasks, as you've seen, graph analytics tasks, and going forward genome analysis tasks. Uh, there's a big need for them. And clearly new systolic architectures and new memories, even though this is the last one over here, it's, it's also very important. Because if you look at the uh, Tesla chip, for example, I didn't look, uh, show it inside, but if you watch the video, you will see immediately that 80% of the chip is memory. Basically, computation, even though computation is very, very important, you need to do all of those matrix multiplications. They're not occupying most of the area. They're not occupying most of the power. Most of the power is consumed in memory. Most of the area is consumed by memory. Most of the reliability issues are also due to memory. So really, these are compute engines. They're accelerating machine learning tasks. But most of them are really dedicated to memory, as we will see. That's why memory is so important. And people are really trying to design around that memory uh, as much as possible. And I believe the wafer scale engine, one of the motivations for this big wafer scale engine was actually so that you can get enough memory on that chip so that you can, you can do the training very, very efficiently. Because if you don't have enough memory, uh, if you don't have enough memory bandwidth also, your training is very slow. And they realized that. And they, I think the reasoning was, uh, how can we put enough memory in this chip? Well, if you go wafer scale, then you have a lot of memory. Right? If you think about a small chip, you can only put so much memory in it. Okay. 
Okay, basically, as I said, computing landscape is very different today compared to 20, 10 to 20 years ago. And applications and technology both demand novel architectures. Uh, applications we've seen, but also technology, like uh, the fact that DRAM technology is not scaling very well, or, uh, or, um, or, or maybe uh, you have reliability issues, you need to think differently about architectures. And as a result, today every component and its interfaces, as well as entire system designs, are being re-examined. So if you look at this picture that I showed you earlier, we're really re-examining all of the components today, including the storage devices over here, uh, including the networking devices actually, which I didn't put over here, but networking is really an integral part of a chip uh, or platform today. Those are being re-examined today, uh, because networking is also getting faster. Uh, and how do you keep up with uh, the, the faster networks uh, becomes important. Okay, so basically, uh, let me motivate you a little bit more. Uh, today, this is actually happening, I think. People are really thinking out of the box with new designs. They're, they're, they're trying to revolutionize the way computers are built. But they're really doing it by understanding both hardware and the software. All of the things that I showed you, uh, starting from 3D XPoint, the machine learning accelerators, like all of the machine learning accelerators, and the, uh, and the in-memory, in-DRAM processing, they're not just hardware. You really need to design the software together with the hardware. These are really prime examples of software-hardware co-designs. And if you read the Google paper, they will say that the software is extremely important and you need to figure out how to design it. If you watch the Tesla video, for example, they have built a compiler for this thing, and programmers need to program in particular ways so that they can take advantage of their chip. So you cannot just assume that you have some hardware that accelerates your task. That was the case in 1990s. Intel used to build much faster single-threaded processors and everything magically became faster. Those days are gone now. Today everything is about making both the hardware and the software uh, co-designed and faster at the same time. So you really need to understand both of them uh, going forward. So if you're, if, if, uh, if, if you're designing systems uh, there, there used to be a time where, when you design large-scale systems, distributed systems, for example, and people used to argue that, oh, I can, uh, I can, I can take some building blocks and hardware, like processors, multi-core chips, for example, and I, uh, I don't need, need to deal with hardware anymore. Those days are gone, basically. Today, whenever you're designing a distributed system, you need to take into account the fact that you have some specialized machine learning accelerators, and you need to figure out how to actually communicate with them. If you have a very fast network, for example, and if you're trying to, uh, so one way of designing distributed systems today is you have computation nodes and you have memory nodes. This way you can specialize the different nodes. And maybe you have a very fast network between them. How do you actually communicate so that latency doesn't become a bottleneck between computation and memory nodes in a distributed system, in a data center setting? That becomes important. And you cannot ignore the fact that you have accelerators maybe here or there. Because if you have comp computed memory engines, now things get blurred, right? You may have computation nodes, but you may, have, you may uh, have the ability to do computation in the memory part as well, in the big memory nodes or storage nodes. If you're able to do computation over there, now you're, the way you think about software has to become different. And you have to think differently because if you actually uh, use, the, use the same way of scaling the systems, you're not going to get enough efficiency. You, you really have to use these accelerators today. That's why all of these big companies are building accelerators. Basically, if you look at any company that you think uh, is traditionally software company, and I think like Microsoft is traditionally software, right? Google, Facebook, they're all traditional software and they're all building their own hardware today. And they're all using them. Actually, I didn't talk about Facebook because they didn't really talk as much about their chips, but they do have their chips that they talked about as well, briefly. Okay, basically, uh, today is the time really to invent these new paradigms for computation, communication, and storage, uh, both at the architecture and the system level. And I will recommend this book uh, uh, to, to you. This is really, uh, I think it's a, it's a very insightful book uh, written by a, a philosophy of science, uh, scientist who works in philosophy of science, Thomas Kuhn. It's called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Has anyone read this book? Okay. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised you read the book. Was this in a class assignment or for fun? Yeah. For fun, okay, that's great. <laughs> then you probably know uh, this book very well. Uh, I used to give this book um, as a prize uh, for students who did really well in my assignments. I never know if they read it, of course, but I'm really glad some people have read it. <laughs> I believe it's taught in philosophy of science uh, lectures, but uh, don't quote me on it. Basically, this book talks about uh, the way science evolves. 
and I think uh, even though even though we are in a computer science department, a lot of what we do, well, I think a lot of some of you are engineers also, which is fine. I don't think there's a distinction between science and engineering in the end. It's really a, a spectrum. Uh, uh, what we do a lot is not just science. It's a lot of what we do is really engineering as well, because we that's how you really build these systems. But what is what is really described over here for hard sciences like physics, uh, biology, astronomy? These are really hard sciences. Uh, is is a cycle of revolution. And the way it happens is basically there, there's a certain period in science where there's no clear consensus. People don't know what to do. Okay, let's ignore that for now. Uh, at some point they figure out what to do and they go into this normal science. And in the normal science there's a dominant theory that's used to explain things. This is business as usual. For example, the earth revolves around the sun. Right? That's very normal science for us today. But it was not normal science. If you go back some number of years, right? And this, uh, there's actually a story in this book related to that. Even something as fundamental as that changed because of a revolution, essentially. People started questioning, does the Earth revolve around the Sun? This evidence doesn't support that. And then they were dismissed. People were saying, no, clearly Sun revolves around the Earth, right? And, <laughs> you, you, uh, and, and essentially, people poked and poked and poked which is really the revolutionary science where underlying assumptions are re-examined because you start building evidence. Here's evidence one, evidence two, evidence three, evidence four, evidence five. The earth, does, uh, the earth revolves around the sun, it's not the other way around. And at some point there's a revolution and you basically switch. And that's how these revolutions happen and this book examines that. I think that, that is applicable to computer architecture also. For example, normal science in 1990s was these out-of-order superscalar engines that are higher clock frequency and uh, wider, deeper pipelines, they're, they're the normal science. Basically, they're going to be how we build processors. And clearly, over time, evidence built up against them, right? The evidence was, okay, it's very hard to power them. You don't get a lot of performance. And basically, people started poking holes. As a result, right now, I believe we're in the period where, uh, maybe somewhere here and here, of course it's very hard to, without hindsight, it's very hard to classify where we are right now, but clearly we're not in the normal science today. We don't have a dominant paradigm, but if, if there's something that's becoming dominant, it's really this AI accelerators, but it's too early to tell whether they will be part of the paradigm or not. Uh, but right now everything is re-examined today. And that's essentially why I like this book, uh, because it really clearly explains where we are today also. But, and if you're interested, you can read these versions. I should put the German version also, but I don't, I, I don't know if there's a credible translation. I like this translation because it's the one I read. Okay, any questions? Nothing so far? Is this boring, interesting? Okay, <laughs> hopefully, bo hopefully not boring. <laughs> Okay, let's start with some, some fundamentals. I'm going to uh, be uh, still a bit more high level, but even more higher level, because I think fundamentals are even more fundamental than what I just discussed. This is really interesting. Fundamentals stay the same across disciplines as well. So let me start with this one. Probably those of you who have taken my course already have seen this, so you, can, you don't need to answer it. Does anybody know what this is? This entire structure, not the train. Has, has anybody been there? Yes, I, I hear. Does anybody want to say where it is? What's the name? No? You've been there, right? Stahlhofen, yes. <laughs> it is Stahlhofen, yes. Uh, and the first time I was there, actually, I was visiting Zurich at that time, uh, before coming here, and I really was fascinated by the structure. Uh, it's Bahnhof Stahlhofen. Or another answer is, it's really the first major piece of a famous architect. Does anybody know who that architect is? <coughs> Probably yes. It's Santiago Calatrava. Well, I guess this doesn't tell you the answer. But, but basically, why is this different? Because it's not a straight line thing. It's really, uh, you can see this description over here. Straight lines and right angles are rare. And it actually follows some different uh, paradigm called zoomorphic architecture. And this was designed by an ETH alumnus, uh, PhD in civil engineering, Santiago Calatrava. You can read more about him if you're interested. Then he has a lot of other interesting designs as well. 
interesting and expensive designs. <laughs> I think Zurich paid a lot for Bahn of Stahlhofen at that time, even though by, uh, it, it's not the most expensive train station by any means, uh, but still it was expensive. But it's new technology, and Zurich transitioned to that new technology at that time, and nobody cares about its price right now, right? That's, 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 that's really fundamental. Once you transition, while you're transitioning to a new technology in any domain, it doesn't matter, you really have to go through some pain and you need to pay money. There's no other way around, as far as I know. There's no free lunch. And that's true for architecture also. That's true for computer architecture also. If you want to transition to that huge AI chip, well, you have to pay some money. And you also need to uh, go through a lot of pain to make sure it happens. And that's, a, that's essentially how Bahn of Stahlhofen came about. Even though it's a very small example, there are much worse examples. But it's different from this in the end, right? I don't know, that's not bad, I would take it. But it's not Bahn of Stahlhofen. This looks like any other Bahn of. Actually, somebody, uh, somebody who follows my lectures figured out that and told me that this is not in Switzerland, this is in Germany. I was fine with it. <laughs> my, my, my goal was to make the point, not to, not to make sure that uh, this was in Switzerland. But I guess if you really want to be specific, I should find something in Switzerland. But you can find a lot of these in Switzerland also. Okay, so these are actually relatively small, but this is a, this is a big one. This is another example. Does anybody know what this is? Don't be shy. I'd like to make this interactive. Yes? Oculus? Oculus, yes. How many people have been there? Okay, more than two. Really? Only that many? This is in New York. I thought more people visited New York. This is actually at the heart of New York. And this is another train station. Actually, it's not just a train station, but it's a big shopping mall underneath also. Uh, and this is also designed by the same architect. Uh, it's uh, Santiago Calatrava, essentially. And it's not as cheap as Stahlhofen. According to Wikipedia, this was $4 billion. And New Yorkers had a lot of issues, at least some, part of, some, uh, some New Yorkers had a lot of issues. And while this was being built, there was a lot of controversy. And in the end, there was not enough money to complete what Calatrava envisioned that he would complete, as you will see in a little bit. But now the transition to the new technology is done. Nobody cares about its cost. You go there and you enjoy it. In fact, some of my students who took uh, my courses in the past, they send me pictures after going there because it's kind of, <laughs> they, they apparently enjoy it. Right? So basically, that's, that's again an example of transitioning to new technology. It was not easy to transition to this technology and it's not perfect in the end, in the eye of the architect at least, or in the eye of the other people as we will see also. But new technology is there and people enjoy it and the cost is not a concern. So let's take a look at this a bit basically. So this is uh, Kalatrava, according to him, uh, Oculus resembles a bird being released from a child's hand. Now I'll let you imagine that over here. Uh, the roof was originally designed to mechanically open, to increase light and ventilation to the enclosed space, as you can see, but that didn't happen. Why? Because there was not enough money. Another fundamental principle, cost is always a design constraint. If somebody tells you that they're not limited by cost, they're not thinking about it for some reason. Either they're lying, probably they're not lying, <laughs> but they're, they're really not thinking about it. There is always a limit to the cost that you can pay. Now, if you want to enable a new technology, you should pay a lot of costs, but there is always a limit. Okay, so there's some strengths, so clearly, as with any technology, uh, there's strengths and praise, as you can see. Basically, this, fo uh, this person from New York Times says, it's a pleasure to report for once that public officials are not overstating the case when they describe a design as breathtaking. So there's a healthy skepticism against public officials over here also, which is good, always. Uh, but of course, uh, there, there are design constraints that people had to go through. Uh, for example, uh, this person also from the New York Times wrote, in the, tame, in the name of security, Santiago Calatrava's bird has grown a beak. Its ribs have doubled in number and its wings have lost their interstices of glass. You can see a bunch of other stuff over here. And then they basically uh, conclude with, it may now evoke a slender stegosaurus more than it does a bird. This is actually very interesting, I think. This is a nice, uh, <laughs> uh, nice critique, uh, architectural critique, 
clearly. But th that's what we do in architecture also, computer architecture also. It's a different nature, but it's very similar. In this case, they think this, it resembles this thing. Uh, and if you really want to know more about it, you can read more about stegosaurus, if, you, if you're into these things. <laughs> I'm sure you can see them in a natural history museum also. Okay, so clearly there, no one is immune to the design constraints, basically. Can, security is a key design constraint, and that's true. That's increasingly true in computer architecture today. In fact, uh, I could have easily started this lecture with security. Uh, because if you look at the security space, uh, even in the security uh, area, not the computer architecture area, people are fascinated by the hardware security. How can we keep hardware secure? Because they've, uh, there, there have been decades and decades of work in terms of security, software security, and people have figured out that uh, the root of trust really l lies in hardware. How do you actually build trust uh, and security into hardware? And people also recently figured out that the hardware we design and we assume to be secure is really not secure. Like the Meltdown and Spectre and we'll cover Rowhammer also. Essentially, we have a lot of these security issues in hardware today. Uh, and that's true for, that's very fundamental basically, that spans across uh, generations. And there's clearly a trade-off between security and performance, and security and cost. And these are trade-offs that you need to deal with in all other domains as well, not just in computer architecture. Another example over here, the design was further modified in 2008 to eliminate the opening and closing roof mechanism because of budget and space constraints. So cost, as you can see over here. Okay, the transportation hub has been dubbed the world's most expensive transportation hub. Almost $3.74 billion, as you can see over here. Even then, you're, uh, the, the reason I put this over here is, uh, even if, it, if, it's, if it's so expensive, you're still limited by cost, as you can see. So cost is very fundamental. Okay, so, uh, so whenever you think about new technology, always think about the cost, but don't be scared by the cost, because if you really want to enable a new technology, you have to accept that cost is going to be there, you just need to manage it. So basically all of these are really a complex trade-off space and you will see that the trade-off space is even more complex than what I just described. We didn't even talk about the energy, we didn't even talk about other stuff related to this building for example, we will see in a bit. But really, you really you're, as an architect you're really uh, dealing with all of these and you're really making trade-offs between different things. Okay, another question, probably I, not many people know where, what this is. Anybody? Yes? I forgot the architect, but he's famous in the US as in Pennsylvania, right? Yes, that's right. It's in Pennsylvania. It's very close to Pittsburgh, actually. One hour, 15 minutes. It's a better view of it. Because this thing doesn't do justice to it. It hides the f waterfall underneath it. But this one really brings about the waterfall, right? And you can see that uh, this is called falling water. Uh, it's, uh, well, we will see the architect in a little bit, but. Uh, you can see that this has some design principle which is really imitating the waterfall that it's on top of and a bunch of other stuff which it's, it's, it's organic architecture it's really supposed to be in harmony with the nature over here so this is also another uh, masterpiece of another famous architect and I use this one because this is really where, where I used to teach uh, this is an assignment that I used to give to students and I think everybody enjoyed going there and another architect who was very principled uh, just like Calatrava, was, Calatrava is uh, it's Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, perhaps the most famous American architect. Uh, not alive anymore, but... Uh, and you can see, uh, basically, based on some lists, you can see that this apparently this is supposed to be one of the 28 places to visit before you die. So if you haven't done it yet, I would suggest doing it. 28 is a small number, because the world is large. I'm curious how they determined that list, because I didn't look at that list. <laughs> Okay, so your first assignment, uh, you're not going to get credit for it, but you can go and visit Bahnhof Stahlhofen and see if you have a different view of it based on what you've just discussed. An extra credit if you repeat it for Oculus, although I understand it's a bit more expensive to go there. <laughs> and you can repeat it for Falling Water, it may be even more expensive to go there. <laughs> Actually, you can drive from New York to Falling Water, but it'll take a while. <laughs> Probably six hours. And uh, it'd be good to appreciate when you go there the beauty and the out of the box and creative thinking. Because these things are really creative leaps, uh, the way I think of them. And there are many examples of this, I just picked some examples. These are the things that push the boundaries forward. If people were building train stations just like uh, Preston train stations, then we wouldn't have these things. People really thought creatively to actually make these happen. And they were persistent. 
to make this happen. They were, uh, I'm sure they got a lot of pushback. In fact, they did get a lot of pushback from many, many people. But they didn't stop. Even though they got the pushback, they also pushed back and they wanted to make these happen. And clearly there are many, many trade-offs in the design of the Bonhoeff, for example, or the other ones. There are strengths and weaknesses and goals of design. It's good to think about this. I, I'm, I'm telling you all this because it's, architecture is really a mindset in the end. And getting into the architecture mindset is very important. Uh, because once you have that mindset, I think it's also a design mindset. And I think you can drive principles on your own for good design innovation too. And I think due dates anytime during this course. If you do it, please send me an email. I'm happy to look at these emails. I actually still have these pictures from Oculus from some of my students, freshman students. But later during the course may be better, but it doesn't matter, I think. Uh, okay, you can apply, because uh, later is better, because you can, may be able to apply what you learned in this course. Okay, but let's do, uh, I, think, I think this is really critical in architecture uh, today. Okay, so let's do our first assignment today. Again, this is not going to be very long, it's very simple. Basically, I want to find the differences of this and that, and you've already seen this, and you've already seen that. And it's not going to be a literal assignment. Uh, basically, you can list all of them after you complete the first assignment. But you can see that there are a bunch of different... Once you, once you try to find the differences between different architectural designs, the first question that comes to my mind is what metric I'm, I'm evaluating these things with. That's why architecture is a very, uh, very metric-oriented area. You really need to define on what basis you're comparing these things. And on what basis can have lots of answers, right? could be functionality, does it meet the specification? That's probably the most basic thing. The question is who specified it, right? It's also good to know that. Uh, reliability, is it reliable or is it going to collapse tomorrow? That's not uh, guaranteed also, right? Space requirement, how much space does it occupy? Uh, cost, which is different from the space. Expandability, can I expand it? Is it reconfigurable? Is it configurable? There are many, many things related to this. Comfort level of the users, happiness level, aesthetics, a bunch of other stuff, right? And I, I clearly didn't list all of them. And you can define these metrics, and also you need to define a methodology to uh, quantify or you qualify these metrics, right? For example, comfort level of users. How do you, how do you quantify that, right? That's true for the architectures we build also, right? This thing over here, uh, at least, uh, is more usable for me compared to some other things. How do you get there, right? Again, this is designed by many, many architects in the end, but it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it embodies a, pretty much all of this actually. <laughs> and more, clearly, because if these were the only concerns that I wouldn't use it, because I need to get performance out of it also, right? And that performance is not here in this case, because it's hard to define performance for a building, I think. Okay, so basically how do you evaluate the goodness of design is always a critical question and you will, uh, you will struggle with it uh, during the course of this course. And if you go uh, lower level, you will see that there are even other metrics like energy, for example, you will see clock cycle time, you will see uh, throughput, there are a bunch of other stuff that you need to evaluate things with. So basically, I think I would also like to think about a key question. How was Kaltrava able to design, especially his key buildings, right? You can have many guesses over here, and I'm not going to go through all of these. But clearly, he is a very hard worker, perseveres, he had dedication over decades, and all of this creativity, out-of-the-box thinking, a good understanding of past design, good judgment and intuition. He had a strong skill com combination in math, architecture, art, and engineering. He, he was able to get money. That's important also. Uh, and you need to be lucky a bit uh, in all of this, this stuff, initiative. But I think these two are very, very important. If you have these two, then you can perhaps drive a lot of these other things. I don't know about creativity, but uh, it's really principled designs. He was basically principled. That's true for many, many architectures also uh, that we will cover uh, that have succeeded and that will probably succeed going into the future. And there is a strong understanding of, commi uh, and, uh, of and commitment to fundamentals. Fundamentals of architecture, fundamentals of design. And hopefully the goal uh, that I have in this course, you will be exposed to and hopefully develop and enhance many of these skills in this course. We'll be very trade-off oriented in the end. We'll look at principles. Does this design violate the principles, for example? Uh, we will look at principles of reliability very soon uh, and security. Uh, and we will, we will always be very close to fundamentals. Even though we will cover very recent research, we will always talk about fundamentals. That's the really interesting part, I think. You can always be very fundamental, but also cover very recent research. Uh, like the AI chip that we discussed, 
that it, it makes very fundamental trade-offs, wafer scale versus chip scale, uh, clearly opens up fundamental trade-offs in reliability, cost, power that we just discussed. I already discussed all of those three. And you really need to think about them. But if you really want to make that happen, you really need to stick to the principle and basically follow a lot of these things, I think. I think this is the job of an architect in the end. Uh, but let me talk about principle designs. Uh, this is in Kalatrava's word. Basically, he says that there are two overriding principles to be found in nature which are most appropriate for building. Optimal use of material and the capacity of organisms to change shape, to grow, and to move. He was not completely successful with Oculus, as you can see, right? Because it's not moving. But I don't know about the optimal use of material. But essentially, he's, he's guided by some principles in the design. And this is somebody else uh, saying, uh, these constructions are inspired by natural forms like plants, bird wings, and the human body. And this is another example from Lisbon. Has anyone seen this one? You can see the name. Uh, it's another train station. But this is, this is the blueprint of it. It's another example of the zoomorphic architecture. I don't know what these are, humans or animal. Uh, I guess endomorphic shapes doing some stuff. <laughs> and that's the principle over here. Uh, and you can see lists over here. And what does this remind you of? I think we've already covered uh, this one easily. What does this remind you of? This is in Sevilla, Spain. Any Spanish here? There are Spanish, I think. Anyone? Has anyone seen this one before? I've seen this one when I visited Sevilla. And uh, when I actually went to Lisbon, uh, the first time, this was the first place I had to go to. And I did. It's very easily accessible from the airport. So what does this remind you of, anybody? Harp. Bird? Harp. Harp, yes. I think harp is probably one of the earliest answers. What else? It's supposed to be a pigeon. <laughs> you can see the eye over there, right? <laughs> but of course, I mean, once it's done over there, anybody can assign any meaning to it, right? You can be the critic. Okay, there's another quote from the other famous architect that we discussed, right? Basically, Frank Lloyd Wright was, uh, said this, architecture should be based upon principle, not upon precedent. As a result, he didn't build this one. He built this one. Uh, and the principle was really organic architecture, which we already briefly talked about. And you can see that when you go to organic architecture, the well-known example is falling water. But there are a bunch of other stuff uh, that is based on the same principle. I like this place, as you can see. I've been there many times. <laughs> I've been to Stadlofen many times also, but it's a bit closer. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, I think the major high-level goals of this course is to understand the principles and understand the precedents also, because you really need to understand both to really innovate and think out of the box. Uh, and based on such understanding, hopefully you can evaluate trade-offs of different designs and ideas, develop principle designs, uh, and develop novel out-of-the-box designs. Uh, and hopefully, the whatever you do afterwards, you don't have to be a computer architect. I think these principles really span the fields. If you do any sort of design, you will need to deal with the sort of trade-offs in the end. And uh, we've, just, we've just talked about this. Focus is really on principles, presence, and how to use them for new designs. And clearly, the focus we have is computer architecture. We could keep going on in the architecture, but as we go deeper and deeper, my knowledge exhausts very quickly. But in computer architecture, I can go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and we'll be here for a year probably. <laughs> but not in real architecture. <laughs> if you want real architecture, probably you should take a course from real architect, uh, an expert in real architecture. Okay, uh, so let me cover this part first and then we'll take a break. Basically, uh, this is my PhD advisor, Yale Pat, and uh, clearly I was influenced by him. Uh, but this is a slide that I like from his uh, lecture notes. Uh, he used to have these lecture notes that are transparencies, and even into the late 2000s, uh, he, he used to be, have these transparencies. And then he transitioned to PowerPoint, and he, it was a costly transition for him, but he figured out that this new technology is very good. So it's another example of a costly transition to a new technology. You do, because how are you going to uh, use transparencies if there is no transparency here? Uh, we have transparencies here. <laughs> or overhead projectors here. So it's not a problem here. But if you take your transparencies to some school and they don't have an overhead projector, you have a problem, right? 
So it's good to make the transition. Anyway, uh, but basically an architect really needs to look everywhere. You have to have eyes everywhere if you really want to be a good architect. Backward, forward, up and down. This is my uh, rendition of uh, that slide over here. Basically you need to look backward, understand the past very well, understand the trade-offs and designs, upsides and downsides, past workloads. Basically build a very good understanding and that understanding will enable you to look forward. Uh, and this clearly requires a lot of thinking and it, it comes, uh, experience also builds up and also uh, reading. This requires a lot of reading because some of these designs don't exist right now, right? I read a lot of papers from the 1960s for example uh, that talk about very very different architectures. It's always good to think about them and uh, maybe uh, reevaluate them today. Looking forward uh, to the future, basically, I think this is really important. An architect is really a dreamer in the end. You can create new designs only by dreaming and by listening to the dreamers. You may think about someone who has a crazy idea. Many people may call them crazy, but a good architect based on experience may figure out uh, and distill the key idea over there and take it to the next step basically and maybe enable a wafer scale chip. Actually wafer scale chips were quite crazy. We don't know if they're, uh, they'll succeed at this point but some good architects listen to the dreamers. In memory processing is another example over here. This is really important, being open-minded and pushing the state of the art, uh, evaluating new design choices. I had something else to say over here but maybe I need some coffee. Okay, looking up is very important because really problems come from the top. Uh, these are problems that people have, uh, different algorithms that people develop. Machine learning is a very good example of this. If an architect is cognizant of what's going on in machine learning, they can, if they understand that problem and their nature, they can build these accelerators much better than anyone else, for example. That's true for other problems coming ahead, for example. Genome analysis could be another one. Who knows, protein folding could be another one, right? Basically, you can develop architectures and ideas to solve these important problems. Uh, look down is also important. Like, if you really want to be a complete architect, well, you also need to understand the technology, what's at the bottom. This, is, this could be, about, for example, phase change memory technology, it could be quantum computing technology, it could be, I don't know, mechanical, uh, microelectro, microelectronic mechanical systems, MEMS technology, different types of technologies basically. How can you make use of them, right? Understand the capabilities so that you can actually make the right trade-offs and use the right technology, right? And also you can predict and adapt to the future of the technology, right? You're really designing, not for today, when you're an architect, you're really designing for n years ahead. Well, you can also decide when you're designing for, right? Of course, as n grows larger, you become more speculative and your success probability reduces probably. Right? If you're designing for just tomorrow, then you know what the workloads are. And years later, you don't know what the workloads are. So you really need to think ahead a little bit and predict. And you can enable the future technology. And this is also true for technology also, not just true for workloads, but also for technology. Uh, like when we were doing the early phase change memory work, uh, we were getting a lot of pushback also, saying that this technology will never be successful. Right? This was in 2007, 2006, at least for main memory. Clearly it was successful for CD, rewritable CDs, right? Uh, but we believed in the technology and we did our homework, do the, did the scaling studies, uh, and we also believed in the technology. You've got to be lucky also. Luck is a part of it over here. Uh, and we did the architectural work to enable that technology. And 12 years later, 10 to 12 years later, we have that chip, uh, 3DX point chip from Intel, right? It's main memory, you can buy it, you can use it on your own. So essentially, I think this looking down is very, very important also. Uh, basically, our reasoning was uh, DRAM technology is not going to scale, you need to replace it with some technology, and the technology we picked was really phase change memory at that time, because we thought that was the best in terms of the scaling characteristics. Now, if you do that study today, maybe some other technology will be uh, even more interesting 10 years down the road. But that's the architect's job, basically, understanding what technology will be good some n number of years ahead. Okay, so let me give you some takeaways. Uh, so basically I think the first takeaway is being an architect is not easy. <laughs> at, least, at least when you're starting, I think it's, it, does, it looks like a daunting task, right? You need to have eyes everywhere. But I think you build up this thing over time. It's not just uh, you, you become an architect right away. Basically you need to consider many things in designing a new system and have good intuition and insight into the ideas and trade-offs. I think this is also really important. This is a bit hard to quantify clearly. Having good intuition is really important because now you can actually do the, pick the right solutions at the right times. But it's fun and it can be very rewarding. 
I wouldn't do anything else basically. Uh, although I like combining architectures with many, many things, like uh, genomics, bioinformatics, as we will see. Uh, and it enables a great future. Like many scientific and everyday life innovations uh, that we take for granted today would not have been possible without architectural innovation. Uh, and they've enabled very high performance systems, like this thing is enabled today. But has anybody used uh, the early cell phones in 1990s, let's say? No, probably not. Maybe most, most of you were not born in 1990s. Maybe. No, you're not that young, I think. <laughs> but basically, this thing is here because we have flash memory that has enabled it, really. I mean, that's part of the, one of the components, clearly, right? There are many, many other components, but I credit flash memory a lot because that has enabled very high amounts of capacity in these devices. True for these devices as well. But there are many, many, many things that went into it. This, this thing has many accelerators, like more than 20 accelerators in it. Okay, I mean, I've already talked about this, but self-driving vehicles would be the next one. Uh, and there are many, many other next ones, maybe genome analysis, and machines, medical machines that you can carry on with you. Uh, initially, doctors will carry on with them probably, maybe later you can carry on with you. Uh, so many other things. So hopefully, uh, my goal in this course is to enable uh, you to become a good computer architect. So I hope you're here for this. Uh, in systems programming or any kind of computer systems course, uh, you think about C as a model of computation, and maybe you talk about processors a little bit, but you don't go into depth. You really think about the programmer's view of how a computer system works. And in digital design, which some of you have taken uh, from me, you think about digital logic as a model of computation, and you really get the hardware designer's view of how a computer system works. So, but, but we're in the middle. As an architect, we're really in the middle. Uh, actually, our digital design is closer to computer architecture also, so if you've taken digital design with me, uh, then uh, you're closer to this course. But if you're taking a traditional digital design course, it's all about digital logic. You don't go into as much architecture. Uh, the way I teach the digital design here is really um, more forward-looking, I would say. It, it covers a bunch of computer architecture concepts over here. But uh, really, in the end, you, talk, uh, you think a lot about hardware designer's view. So the key question is, what happens in between? And we're going to talk about what happens in the team. We're, going to, we're not going to exactly answer all of these questions since it's an advanced course. Uh, if you've taken my computer uh, uh, digital design course, we've answered some of these questions. But we're going to be in the middle. Let me ask the question. How many of you have taken a systems programming or computer systems course? Hopefully most of you. How many of you have not taken? Don't be shy. Okay. I mean, you don't need it that much in this course, uh, this part, so it's okay. But it's good to think about systems level issues also. What about this one? Digital logic, digital design, some sort of computer architecture. How many of you have taken it? Okay, many of you. How many have not taken it? Don't be shy again. Okay. Okay, this one you may need to brush up sometimes uh, because we may assume some things. But I think most of the uh, things will be self-explanatory and we're going to redo some of the labs uh, also, so uh, stay tuned for that. Okay, so basically we're going to see a lot of the my architect or microarchitect views, uh, microarchitect's view, how to design a computer that meets the system design goals, and the choices you uh, make in the middle over here critically affect what's up here and what's down here. You basically are really determining the destiny of the software programmer as an architect, and also the hardware designer. I mean, an architect usually is also a hardware designer, but that's not always the case. So if you look at a, uh, big companies like Intel, NVIDIA, for example, usually architects design the architecture of the system and the building blocks. And there's, there are also logic design teams that do the logic design. That's what I mean by determining the destiny of the logic design teams. Basically, you're really, if, you, if you specify an architecture that's not easy to build, those logic design teams will basically go like this, I guess. If I had hair, I would do it. <laughs> Okay, so keep that in mind. This is really about software and hardware in the end. Uh, let's see, how, ma how many more things do I have? And then I would like to take a break. Okay, I have a few more slides if you don't mind, and we'll take a longer break. Uh, but we're going relatively slowly for my pace. <laughs> so uh, does anybody know about Hamming, Richard Hamming? Hamming distance? Yes, okay. You should know about Richard Hamming, because Hamming distance is everywhere. If you don't, learn about it. But this is him. And he said that the purpose of computing is to gain insight. And I very much agree with that. Basically, we gain and generate insight by solving problems. 
how do we ensure problems are, uh, the key question is how do we ensure problems are solved by electrons? So this is something that we will see a lot in this course. It's really all about hardware and software, the stack. Uh, the computing, I call this the computing stack. Some other people call the levels of transformation, for example. But you always start with a problem. And in the end, you need to solve the problem, at least in existing dominant technology, with electrons. Uh, in the end, everything consists of electrons, so you can, I think this is safe to say for any technology today uh, that we know of. So basically, the key question is how do you communicate the problem to the electrons? Uh, at least, at, uh, currently, we don't know how to speak to the electrons, right? I don't know how to communicate with a single electron. Electron, please go from here to here and do this. I don't know that. So we'll build up a stack, basically. We translate the problem to the algorithm. An algorithm has some definition, which I'm not going to go into in detail, but basically, there's a very precise definition for an algorithm. It's a step-by-step -step procedure that's guaranteed to terminate, where each step is precisely stated such that it can be carried out by a computer. So it needs to be finite, ending, it needs to be definite, precise, and it needs to be effectively computable. Every step should be effectively computable by a Turing machine. How many of you have taken a, a computation theory course, theory of computation? Okay, that's good. So you would know what an algorithm is. Uh, I think computation theory, theory and architecture are actually very close to each other in the sense that uh, I think architecture is very fundamental and theory is of course clearly very fundamental. But architecture is a bit practical side of the theory. Uh, you don't exercise as much theory, you will see in this course. But it's really about, the, it's, it's really about something very fundamental at its heart. Uh, okay, and you can have many algorithms for the same problem clearly. And of course you take the algorithm and translate it to a programming language and create a program and then that gets executed on a runtime system which has many components which could be virtual machines, operating systems, memory management and then it really uh, gets translated into this uh, instruction set architecture, a set of instructions. It's basically, this is really the interface or contract between the software and the hardware at this point. That's why it's yellow over here. Uh, it's really what the programmer assumes the hardware will satisfy. We're not going to cover as much of this in this course. We covered a lot of, uh, in the digital logic course. It's an interesting area, especially thinking about new instruction set architectures for these accelerators are really, really important today. How do we make them easily programmable? How do you actually, actually thinking about the whole stack for these new accelerators are really important. Uh, but in this course, we're not going to talk a lot about instruction set architecture. And then there's the microarchitecture, the greener levels, which is really the hardware side, let's say. Uh, it's really an implementation of the instruction set architecture and there could be many implementations of the same instruction set architecture. You could have an add instruction for example that could be implemented in a thousand different ways. Again, which we're not going to go into that. You've, you've seen that in digital circuits if you've taken it. If you haven't seen it, that's not also important. Uh, the level of abstraction we're going to have here is really we have an adder and we can add with it. Right? Uh, okay, and then microarchitecture gets implemented in logic, uh, and then uh, these, are, these are basically the building blocks of microarchitecture, the gates, AND gate, NAND gate, OR gate, uh, and you know that uh, if you have a NAND gate it's universal, essentially you can translate any boolean function to uh, be implemented with NAND gates or NOR gates, uh, and then you implement it with some sort of devices, right? These are different types of transistors, for example. Uh, which we're not going to, we're definitely not going to go into uh, in, uh, as much, except in some memory parts we'll talk about uh, briefly. Okay, so the focus we have is over here essentially in this course, but we're going to touch upon uh, these parts as well. And I think whenever, well, whatever we discuss, actually I should probably expand this, we're going to touch more about these parts uh, in this incarnation of this course. Uh, but you should always think about what happens over here with the machine learning accelerator or genomics accelerator, for example. How do you change the algorithm to take advantage of the hardware? Not just that, but how do you design the algorithm and the architecture, microarchitecture together and the ISA in between so that you can really solve the problem, which is really what the goal is in the end, right? You're really trying to solve a problem. How do I make machine learning training a thousand times more efficient than today? Well. You develop the algorithm and the hardware together, essentially. That's essentially what's happening uh, in the field today. Okay, this is an aside. I like going through these asides because some people didn't talk about Hamming, but basically this is Hamming's fundamental work. If you're interested, I would recommend reading it. This is where he introduced the Hamming distance and error correcting codes. Uh, and Hamming distance, hopefully, most of you know, it's really the number of locations in which the corresponding symbols of two equal length the strings are, is different. For example, if I take, let's see, if I have a good example over here. Uh, 
Why don't I have a good example over here, you think? Number and length. These are six character strings, right? And the hamming distance between them is six. Because they don't match in any of the characters. But if you, ha if you had number and numero, then they would match in NUM, so the hamming distance would be only three. Now this is an example. Okay, we'll talk about edit distance later on, which is different. Number and numero will have a different edit distance compared to uh, hamming distance. And you can guess what that is probably. Right? Actually, they match in a lot more places that, than you think uh, if, you, if you're able to shift the, one of the strings to the left or right. Okay, we'll talk about that. But basically, this work developed a theory of codes that is used for error correction and detection. It's very fundamental. Uh, and uh, a lot of the work that is built on error correction is built on this one. We'll talk about error correction in memories later on. And you will see that a lot of the concepts are built on Hamming distance. And also, I would recommend, especially if you're interested in doing research uh, uh, at a master's or PhD level, this is a talk that was delivered by uh, Richard Hamming at Bell Labs when he was uh, to, to all of his colleagues on how to do research. This is principles on how to do research. I definitely recommend this one. Uh, he has a video also, but I think uh, the transcript is better than the video itself. It, it goes over a lot of principles on how to do good research. Okay, so another uh, level of, level of, levels of transformation is this. It's always good to construct, uh, deconstruct what you've seen. I think this, clearly now I've broken this such that the user is an integral part. And I think going forward, we really need to think of it that way. User could be anybody, right? User could be someone who has a problem, someone who's designing the algorithm, someone who's designing the programming language or, program, or doing the programming itself, someone who's designing these systems or directly interacting with them, someone who's designing the ISA and directly writing code to it, and it could be also someone who's designing the microarchitecture, right? Or maybe user needs to interact with the microarchitecture in some way, which is really interesting, I think. So basically, it's good to deconstruct these levels of transformation and think about how do we incorporate user into the, uh, into the stack. Because in the end, you're designing computing computers for someone. Uh, and that someone is really the user. It could be a human user, it could be a machine user, or it could be some other user, I don't know. Uh, but in the end, you have to really specialize and customize for the user. Okay. So, uh, let me talk. I think this may be a good place to take a break, actually. What do you think? Let's take a break for 20 minutes. Okay. I think it's time to continue. Is everybody awake? We're getting there. Cool. Well, we haven't lost as many people as I thought we would lose, but let's see. <laughs> okay, uh, so we covered the transformation hierarchy, or levels of transformation, uh, or the computing stack, let's say. <clears throat> and I'd like to point out that this actually is important in, in some other way, which is really from the abstraction perspective. These levels of transformation create abstractions. Let me drink this a bit. Basically, uh, between the layers, uh, between or between the levels. So, uh, and this is useful in the sense that a higher level only needs to know about the interface to the lower level and not how the lower level is implemented. So, you go from programming language to ISA, let's say. You just need to know the interface, right? You don't need to know what the uh, how, I, how the ISA is implemented. You go from uh, you don't need to know the microarchitecture, for example. The lower level details are abstracted from you at the higher level. Now, this is a good thing. Uh, for example, another example is high-level language programmer does not really need to know what the ISA is and how a computer executes instructions. This is great for productivity. No question about that. No need to worry about the decisions that are made in the underlying levels. Somebody else made them, or you made them at some point, but you forgot about them. Now you're programming the device, right? For example, programming in Java versus C versus assembly versus binary versus by specifying the control signals for each of each transistor every cycle. Which one do you prefer? Probably not the last one, right? You don't want to really program every single transistor in your machine. You really want to be at a higher level here, in fact Python, right? Uh, you really want to be at a higher level so that you don't need to deal with a lot of the stuff that goes underneath. You don't want to do assembly, for example. So this is good for productivity. 
But if you want to get performance, of course, there might be a different issue, right? If you really want to get very high performance, maybe you want to go into assembly, right? Maybe you don't want to do binary because it's really a translation. Binary is basically ones and zeros, right? There's really no useful exercise going from assembly to binary except somebody needs to do it and that somebody is really the compiler, right? Uh, but between C and assembly, there's a huge difference, clearly. And between Java and C, there's probably another huge difference. Uh, so the question is then, why would you want to know what goes on underneath or above? And I've already given you a reason, right? Uh, productivity, uh, abstraction is great for productivity, but if you want to get performance, that's one reason uh, to go into uh, what happens underneath or above. So basically, why do we want to cross the abstraction layers? And the chips that I've shown you earlier to motivate this class, they all break these abstraction layers, basically. If you're a programmer of that chip, you cannot be you cannot say, I don't want to know what's going on in hardware. You really need to know what's going on in hardware over there. Uh, and that's how they get the high performance. Why? Because they have a problem. Basically, uh, as long as everything goes well, maybe not knowing what happens underneath is okay. But once you have a problem, then you'd rather know about what's going on underneath. I give this example over here, right? This thing, right now it's going well, it's recording nicely, it's operating fine. If it's not going well, what do I do? If I knew exactly how it was implemented underneath, I could potentially fix the problem, right? But I don't, so I'm clueless. So I have to call someone who knows what's going on underneath in this interface. It's very fundamental, again. With any kind of design, you run into this issue. And in computing, you run into this issue also. So there are many kinds of problems. Performance problems, what if the program you wrote is running slow? Correctness problems, what if the program you wrote doesn't run correctly? You think it's correct, but it doesn't run correctly. So what's going on? Right? Maybe it's implemented incorrectly underneath, right? Maybe the ISA specification is not something that you expect, right? But to be able to know that, you really need to know what goes on underneath. And this happens a lot to you. Just, your system just shut down and you have no idea why. I think this should not happen, but it's happening. How many of you experienced this problem? It's good to know I'm not the only one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and someone just compromised your system and you have no idea how, basically. All of these are problems and there, you can list many, many of these things, right? Uh, and you can solve these problems only by knowing what's really underneath. Uh, and also, uh, at the lower level, these are higher level problems. And the lower level in the hardware, what if the hardware you designed is too hard to program? There could be programs over there also. If you don't know how the software is supposed to use it, or if you don't provide a good interface, basically, essentially, you may design some hardware that's useless. And we've seen many of these cases in, in real industry, actually. Uh, if you don't design that a chip, uh, AI chip, a machine learning chip, such that it's usable by your programmers to begin with, then you have a problem, right? Uh, I mean, even very large companies have difficulty in getting uh, very different hardware adopted in real life. And I'll give you the example of Intel. Intel has been a very innovative company for decades and decades. And uh, when they were transitioning from a 32-bit ISA to 64-bit ISA, they wanted to take the opportunity and they wanted to completely change the instruction set architecture. They basically said x86 is good, but we want to completely change it to, by taking the opportunity uh, to go from 32 bits to 64 bits. So they completely redesigned the ISA to be 64 bits. And they put a lot of burden on the software compilers. Uh, this is called IA64. How many, are, how many of you are familiar with IA64? Okay, some of you are good. How many of you programmed in IA64? Nobody. And nobody is programming in IA64 today. Well, not nobody, but very few people. And Intel basically put a lot of effort and a lot of money into this new architecture, IA64, which is actually a really nice uh, ISA at, in many respects. Maybe not in all respects, but in, all, in many aspects it's very nice ISA. But it didn't succeed. Why? Because, well, I don't want to say too hard to program, but maybe it was too hard to adopt uh, for many people. Because it's really changing everything. All of the software base that used to execute in x86 now needs to be moved to IA64. Even a company like Intel could not pull it off. Well, what happens? You have a competitor, AMD at the time. They did not make that design decision. They said, we're going to make the minimal changes to the instruction set architecture so that we're going to add support for 64 bits. And they called it x86-64 as opposed to moving to 
uh, IA64. Uh, and everybody adopted that easily, including Intel. So AMD solution is now everywhere right now. So basically, this is an example. Uh, if you make things too hard to program, or if you don't compensate for the fact that things are too hard to program, your hardware may not be useful. So all of the Itanium hardware is not used uh, right now, as far as I know. It's used probably somewhere and for some things, but it's not general purpose. It's not what it was imagined. But what if the hardware you designed is too slow because it doesn't provide the right primitives to the software? Software is doing something and your hardware doesn't support it. Uh, this is another example. If, for example, uh, the early... Uh, how many of you ter know the term RISC? R-I-S-C. Okay, reduced instruction set computer. Right now it's very popular with RISC V, right? But uh, the early RISC philosophy is make the hardware as simple as possible and ensure that the soft uh, and, and so software handles everything, like high performance. That's the philosophy. That's a very principled design, actually. It's a good principle, but you need to be careful sometimes when how much you push the principles. Uh, so this RISC philosophy, the current RISC engines are very different, by the way. This RISC philosophy, initially, what they said, uh, what, what, uh, if, if, you, if you come from this philosophy from a very pure perspective, then you eliminate a lot of instructions, right? For example, why do you need to have a multiplier in hardware? You can have adds and shifts, right? And basically the software converts multiplies into adds and shifts and you don't have a multiplier. Now, good idea, bad idea? If your program is doing a lot of multiplies, a terrible idea. Because you're executing all of these adds and shifts many, many times to do a single multiplication. But if you had a hardware multiplier, then you had the right primitive exposed to your software, which is supposed to do a lot of multiplies. Right? So those risk engines, the early risk engines that didn't have multiplies, quickly reverted that design decision. Okay, we might want to add some more complexity into hardware to have this multiply. So there are a lot of examples like this. Uh, and if you're a programmer and you, you want, you're trying to figure out why your multipliers are running slowly, you may want to know what's going on in the multiplier, right? Especially in a systolic architecture uh, like, the, uh, like the machine learning accelerators that we've seen. A lot of them are systolic architectures. As a programmer, you have a big role in orchestrating how the data arrives at the functional units and how it gets processed. You don't basically want to waste cycles. That's exactly what Google paper was saying. The programmer doesn't need to be aware of this matrix multiply unit, but if they're aware, they can reduce the latency significantly. That's like essentially related to this. Okay, what if you want to design a much more efficient and higher performance system, which is essentially exemplified by all of the things that we've discussed, all of those machine learning accelerators, then you have to really cross these abstraction layers. You cannot say, I only know about this layer and I don't care about the rest, when vice versa for some other layer. That's not how things are today. Okay, basically, uh, hopefully in this course, we're going to cross these abstraction layers a lot uh, over many, many examples. Uh, and the hope, hopefully this will enable us to be better understand how a processor, take this processor broadly, it's not just the CPU, it's also the memory, it's also the interconnect, it's also all of the accelerators related to it. Uh, we don't have a good name for it, I think. Maybe a platform is the best name, but... Uh, uh, basically, how, how this works underneath the software layer and how the decisions made in the hardware affect the software and the programmer. Hardware and the software, software interface, I should say, over here. And hopefully this will enable you to uh, be comfortable in making the design and optimization decisions that cross the boundaries. And we will look into software quite a bit also. Prefetching is one example where hardware-software cooperation is very much needed today, uh, in my opinion. Okay, prefetching is to tolerate memory latency. You have a long memory latency. Uh, you don't want to pay that memory latency for every single memory access. So what do you do? You have an automated mechanism that brings the data into the processor before you actually need to access it. And that's employed. That's not, it's, if you think about it, it's not a hardware concept. It's not a software concept. It's a concept. It's, it's basically something that is there. You can implement in hardware or you can implement in software. And if you, I, I would like you to approach the course this way also. Anything that we discuss here can be implemented in software or hardware. Uh, it's, it's really amazing how, how much you can push the software down by making the hardware as minimal as possible. In the end, what you really need is just transistors, right? Course, potentially, you can make the transistor in the software also, but I haven't figured out how to do that yet. <laughs> as long as you can, you, can, you can control all of the values that goes into the transistors in the software. That's the lowest level of software uh, you, you can get in software. 
So it's, it's, it's good to have this mindset. That way you can actually figure out where you push, put the hardware software boundary. Okay. okay, let me give you some examples in the remaining time on crossing these boundaries. These are going to be based on my research, which I know best, I think, uh, and things that I'm fascinated about. This is actually an old, uh, uh, old multi-core chip, it's AMD Barcelona. In 2006, uh, I had this picture. And you can see that the chip has cores, some caches. These are actually private caches. There are also L1 caches inside the core. Uh, and there's a shared L3 cache over here, and there's a memory controller, there's a memory interface, and there are memory chips over here, as you can see. I still use this picture. This picture is 13 years old. <laughs> but uh, another takeaway is not much has changed from the system perspective uh, today, but we're going to talk about some revolutionary ideas uh, later on, how we can change the system. Uh, and basically, at the time we were thinking about these multi-cores, uh, we were thinking the trend was actually having many cores on a chip and this trend is already there I think we've already seen these chips actually some of these chips are many many more cores as you've seen in the um, uh, in the Cerebras chip they, ha they have 400,000 cores now the question is what is a core of course that's always a problem like I put uh, quotation marks inside the cores over here because NVIDIA's definition of a core is very different from AMD's or Intel's definition of a core these are very big powerful high performance hefty cores whereas these are very very simple cores that's why it's good to take this core with a grain of salt but basically uh, the reason to have multiple cores on a chip is because it's hard to scale the performance of a single core in general I think it's also very fundamental it's a lot easier to stamp out multiple simple cores and this is simpler and lower power than a single large core if you can parallelize your program really well across those simple cores you can also get better performance and better power efficiency. The key is, of course, if you can parallelize your program really well. We're going to get, that, get to that later on when we talk about heterogeneous architectures. We're going to talk about bottlenecks in programs. Uh, like when you do a multi-threaded programming, uh, you have a lot of bottlenecks in terms of some threads may be critical threads and they may be delaying other threads. In that case, you don't have perfect parallelization, right? That thread is blocking all of the other threads because it's holding a lock and it's doing a long latency operation on that lock, on that shared data structure. Now how do you handle that? If you have these cores that are very simple, only one core would be making progress and everybody else would be waiting for it. Right? That's an example where multi-core doesn't work really well. So if your programs are doing that a lot, maybe you should not be designing a multi-core system. Right? Anyway, I'm digressing a, a bit, but these are the sort of trade-offs that you make uh, when you design, uh, design specialized architectures. But this was a trend in, in uh, starting from 2002 to even right now actually this multi-core is going on but it's, it's a little bit leveled off in the sense that people realize quickly that having these homogeneous multi-core systems where every core is the same is not going to buy us uh, very scalable performance into the future because software is not very easy to parallelize in many many domains. There are cases where things are easy to parallelize like GPUs but even GPUs want to become more general purpose and as they want to become more general purpose you want to put some more specialized engines. For example, today's GPUs are able to do very very uh, high performance machine learning training but they're not doing a lot of that training inside the GPU core itself. They have specialized accelerators. Uh, I don't remember what they were called, MPUs probably something. I don't, I don't remember what NVIDIA calls them but some sort of neural processing units let's say. They're specialized and you can use them. Yes. Okay, tensor cores. Yes, thank you. Yes, <laughs> there are so many different names for these things. TPU is Google's name, tensor cores, Nvidia's name. Yes. So you need specialization inside uh, this chip also. That's true for all of the other chips as well. Okay, but I'm going to tell you a story about multi-core right now. So forget about all of that specialization. The problem becomes worse with specialization actually. So basically, uh, the thinking was you have very heavy parallel processing on a single chip you get much faster applications, you get newer applications. And this was true actually, this became true over time. The GPUs actually enabled a lot of ap new applications, for example. Uh, maybe not, not multi-core multi maybe was not as successful as GPUs in the sense, but GPUs are fundamentally multi-core and they have a special nature of multi-core, which we will cover in this course also. Okay, so if you, if you have many cores on a chip, what you really ideally want is n times the system performance with n times the cores, right? As you grow the number of cores, you should get exactly linear scaling. Now later we will cover, cover multiprocessors at some point in this course and you will see that you don't normally get linear scaling. 
And if you get super linear scaling, meaning that if you get 2n the performance with n times the course, then you should always question that result. <laughs> How did this happen, right? It could be because of an unfair comparison. Maybe your baseline is not good. Or it could be because you're not just scaling the number of cores, you're also adding more memory to the system. Usually that's the case, actually. Usually uh, it's, it's one, or, one, or, one or the other. And if you find a case where it's neither and something else, let me know. That's another thing that's very fundamental. You either have an unfair baseline or you have, you're adding something else. Okay, so what do we get today? This was the question that we asked when we were very interested in doing this. This was the first work that I did actually when I, was at, when I started Microsoft Research. Uh, I was thinking about how do we actually scale multi-core systems into the future. And we had these multi-core systems that are coming up from Intel and AMD at that time, but IBM also. Uh, and we wanted to understand the bottlenecks that we have in the system. And we, we thought memory was a big bottleneck. And you will see more of that starting from later today or tomorrow. But this is one study that we did on an Intel Pentium D, for example. Intel Pentium D is a very special uh, device at that time. It was not, it was really literally stamping two Intel cores uh, next to each other and not, much, not adding a whole lot else to handle the multi-core issues. And we ran two applications in the system. It's just one example. Uh, one application is MATLAB and the other is GCC. Some of you may be familiar with both or either. Uh, I've used both in my life. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I like MATLAB. <laughs> I like MATLAB better than GCC, actually. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, what, what I'm going to show you should not happen even if you like MATLAB. <laughs> Basically, uh, when you run these two applications together uh, in two different cores, it's a two-core system, and when you compare the performance of each application compared to when it's run alone on the same system, you get this result. MATLAB slows down by 7%, GCC slows down by 3x. So when the two applications are running together, one application slows down a whole lot more compared to the other application. And we call these the unfair slowdowns, essentially. Uh, and, the key, and then the, so assume, assume that you're a software designer. You run this application on a cloud, and the cloud somehow schedules MATLAB and GCC together on the same machine, on two different cores, and your MATLAB slows down significantly. What do you do, right? You have no idea. If you don't know what's going on underneath, you have no idea. So it's a very good example of crossing the abstraction layers. And so we actually went ahead and as a software designer, you may think in the operating system, I will uh, reduce the priority of this and increase the priority of this somehow. And if you do that, you get the same result. Nothing changes. Why? Because you have only two processes in the system and the operating system schedules both of these single-threaded processes on uh, the two cores simultaneously. Priority doesn't matter at that point because priority matters if you have more, than the, the more processes than the number of cores and then how long you allow each process to execute it in each core is determined by the operating system. But if the operating system has two cores and two applications, it basically says, I don't care about the priority. I'm assuming that whenever I put the application, each application, uh, on a core, they're going to make progress. But that assumption is actually violated in this case. This makes much faster progress than this one. So there are a lot of th assumptions over here. The operating system is assuming that whenever it puts a process on a core, it's going to make progress. This is actually still true, but that's actually, uh, that assumption is true, but the operating systems are still not as much aware of what's going on in hardware. They, they still assume that whenever you schedule a thread, they're going to make progress, but that thread may be waiting for memory, maybe getting delayed in some place. Only when you have an I.O. request to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the disk, then you get deschedule. But the, with, the, with the smaller latencies, like memory latency, you don't get deschedule. The operating system has no idea what's going on after it schedules the uh, process in a core. This is another place where thinking needs to be done, the operating system architecture interface. Actually, that's a place that's, that's very much ignored even today, in my opinion. You see all of these accelerators, they're very specialized, but they're really bypassing the operating system, in a sense, and the operating systems are not really uh, improving as much because they're, 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 the, the disconnect between operating system and architecture is not really uh, being uh, uh, closed. Okay. 
so I'm giving you this result. And we call this the memory performance hog. As you can see, this was published in Usenix Security. It's a security paper. Uh, and when I presented this work in Usenix Security, I was in a, a session called Low Level. <laughs> now security conferences actually want all the low-level stuff because they know that the hardware security is uh, the prime place to look into. Uh, okay, we call this a memory performance hog, and we said that you could actually construct an attack like this, and we, had to, we construct a much worse program than MATLAB as well, but you can read the paper for that. Uh, so there are multiple questions over here, some of which we kind of touched on. Can you figure out why the application slowed down if you do not know how the underlying system and how it works? I assume the answer is no, unless you have a counterexample you can figure out. Okay. Can you figure out why there's disparity in slowdowns if you don't know how the system executes the programs? Basically, there's a disparity in slowdowns. Right? It's not just both of them are slowing down equally. If both of them are slowing down equally, then probably you have better guesses, right? Maybe somehow they're getting delayed and they're getting delayed equally because they're interfering with each other. We'll see the example. So, and then the next question is, of course, once you figure out what's going on, can you fix the problem? But it's very hard to fix this problem without knowing what's happening underneath. You really need to know what's going on underneath. Of course, I haven't given you enough information, right? Uh, maybe I'll give you, uh, maybe I'll ask you the question. Why is there any slowdown, you think? So you have two cores, uh, and they're uh, executing two applications. Ideally, none of them should slow down, right? But we're seeing slowdowns. One of them is slowing by 7%, the other is slowing by 3x. Any guesses? Yes? That's right. So that's one hypothesis, right? They could be sharing memory, meaning that whenever one is accessing memory, the other one cannot access it. As a result, it could get delayed. They can generalize that to main memory, caches. Basically, any shared resource that they have, they could delay each other. Okay, any other guesses? Any other reason why they might be slowed down? I think one of them accesses locations in the memory that are closer to each other and then they have priority. Okay, that's right. So that's the interference. Maybe you're answering the second part. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get back to that, hold that thought. There could be other reasons for slowdown. If you know the system, right? Maybe if you're actually running two programs at the same time, uh, you're putting too much burden on the power infrastructure and the uh, hardware or the operating system is throttling one of the cores or both of the cores, right? Could be possible. The system is not designed for full fast execution of both programs at the same time. That could be another reason. This is not the reason in this case, but there could be reasons like that. Whenever you get slowdowns, you may want to actually look into power and thermal issues. And today, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling is employed very heavily and aggressively in processors. Uh, and that might be a reason. Yes? Maybe internet access, if one is really hogging the Ethernet mm -hmm. card, yeah, exactly. That's another resource, shared resource interference problem. I agree. Although th these applications are not doing that. <laughs> GCC is very local, MATLAB is very local. Maybe some sort of operating system schedule or now takes time, more time to complete the administrative work like context switches or similar. I see. Uh, basically what you're saying is there's interference from some other software, meaning some operating system tasks are getting scheduled and they're delaying. Yeah, that's certainly also possible, actually. In this case, it was not happening because we controlled and make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, but yes, that's certainly possible also. Basically, a lot of these things that you're discussing are really about shared resource interference. You have some shared resource and uh, the, the applications are interfering with each other or somebody else is interfering with these applications. Uh, and power is also a shared resource when you're running multiple applications together. Even thermals are a shared resource. When you're running multiple applications together, you're really putting a lot, of, a lot more burden on that shared resource. As a result, somebody else is throttling you. Okay, so that's, that's why there could be slowdowns. But about, what about the disparity in slowdowns? Why is there a disparity? Now your answer, I think, makes sense. Because the programs may be behaving differently, right? In terms of how they access the shared resource. For example, if there's a shared cache, uh, 
one application, when it's running alone, it makes perfect utilization of the shared cache. It gets very good locality. The other application, it doesn't. The cache is useless for that application. Now, when they're running together, the application that has very good cache locality gets kicked out from the cache because the other application is behaving badly, let's say. Badly in the sense that it's very memory intensive, it's kicking out blocks of this application, but it's not benefiting from that. As a result, this one is not slowing down because the cache is useless for it anyway, but it's kicking out blocks for this application that could make use of the cache if it were running alone. Then you get a disparity in the slowdowns, right? Basically, the disparity happens because applications benefit differently from the shared resource, and whenever they're interfering with each other, you're really causing trouble to the application that benefits more if it were running alone, and uh, you're, uh, the other application is not slowing down as much. Okay. So how do we solve the problem if we don't want that disparity? Hold that thought for now. Uh, let's talk about this particular case. But before we talk about this, uh, what, this particular case, I'm going to give you why this happens in this particular example. But all of these are actual potential examples. Uh, by the way, before we go on, can anybody think of what else could be a dis the reason for disparity and slowdowns? Yes? One is uh, asking more of the shared resource and not giving the other one any chance. Mm -hmm. Maybe GCC just needs uh, some memory access once in a while, mm -hmm. but really needs it to make progress. Exactly. And that is just hitting requests uh, <coughs> no end uh, mm -hmm. to memory. Exactly, yeah. That's exactly the problem over here. But yes, basically they both benefit from the shared resource in that case, but one is getting delayed too much because the other one's very aggressive. That's a bit different from what I just discussed earlier about the cache. In the cache, one of them is not benefiting as much, the other is benefiting. And when you put them together, that amplifies to a significant disparity. But here, both of them should get the resource and benefit from the resource, but one of them is delaying the other one because it's very aggressive. That's a very good point. Any, anything else? Okay. So uh, you may wonder why this is important. Uh, basically, actually this is important in many, many uh, reasons, but I'll give you some reasons. Basically, we want to execute applications in a parallel in, in, in multi-core systems. You want to consolidate more and more for efficiency. If you want, want to uh, build a cloud, for example, you want to build hardware with lots of cores, and you want to ensure that uh, the, uh, the application, you, you, want, you want to be able to schedule many applications in those cores. You don't want to um, uh, make them unutilized. You want the cloud to be utilized, essentially. Mobile phones, another example. If I have 10 cores over here, I want to be able to do stuff on those cores, right? Especially if I, if I have multiple stuff to do. Now, I want, I want to be able to listen to some music, for example, while, I'm doing, while my virus checker is running, while I'm doing email, Dot, dot, dot. I'm limited by, in the end, my interface, not, not the cores over here. Right? And the interface out of this, that's also important. Basically, that's a totally different subject, but the interface between the human and this phone is not very great, perhaps, today. And that's another reason why things may not be as utilized underneath. Right? Okay, but basically we want to do many more things at the same time. That's true for automotive. Actually, there's a huge push uh, in automotive systems to actually uh, have a single chip doing everything related to a car. If you don't design that single chip, today uh, different chips do different things. One chip does the braking, one chip does the DVD control, one chip does the driver assistance, one chip does something else. And there, in the end there are more than 100 chips. I think somebody quoted 300 at some point. I don't know if that's true. But more than 100 chips in a single car today. Uh, but people are trying to consolidate more and more so that they have more better control and maybe better predictability and easier software as well. Uh, so there's a push for consolidation in automotive systems uh, too. I think that's one of the reasons why Tesla is trying to build its own chips as well. Uh, but we want to mix different types of applications together also and uh, those requiring quality of service guarantees. An example could be this, right? You may, you may want to detect pedestrians really easily and quickly. Uh, you don't want to make mistakes over there. But some other ones may not be as important, right? Your DVD player, who knows? And there may be other ones that are even less important, right? So basically, you want, you want the system to be controllable and high performance. That's why you don't want these huge disparity and slowdowns. 
the slowdowns may be unavoidable as long as you can control them, right? Uh, we're going to talk about that also. Basically, can you actually design a system with shared resources, uh, with applications with different requirements, and satisfy the requirements all, of all of the applications at the same time? Clearly, if you keep putting lots of applications, at some point you're not going to be able to satisfy the uh, requirements of the applications because you have limited resources. But how much can you push the system such that you can put as many applications as possible while keeping the controllability? Controllability meaning that I want this application to be slowed down by no more than this, some, some, some performance guarantee basically, and doing it for all applications in the system. While, uh, uh, and if, you, if you are able to do that, then you can be high performance and controllable at the same time. Okay, so let's go to this particular example. As I said, this was Intel Pentium D, although we replicated the result for AMD and different processors as well. But let's take a look at this system. If you look at this system, you have cores, you have private L2 caches, you have some interconnect, and you have a shared memory controller and shared DRAM banks. Essentially, the memory system is shared, and part of the interconnect is also shared, actually. Uh, and if you run MATLAB and GCC, this is what happens. MATLAB has a lot of requests, GCC has one request once in a while, just like you described, and somehow the memory controller prioritizes MATLAB's requests, like this. And GCC, the poor GCC doesn't get its request serviced for a long time. And we identify the problem as unfairness in the memory controller. So this is really because the memory controller is really not aware of these cores. Not aware of the fact that requests are coming from the different cores, and as a result its policies are unfair. Let's take a look at that a bit. So we're going, to, we're going to dig even deeper. Now we dug a little bit deeper, looked at the system, and identified the problem to be here. Now, what are the components of the problem? Why is the memory controller being unfair? That's the next question. So let's take a look at how a single DRAM bank operates, and then you can generalize from uh, to the multiple DRAM banks over here. But if you look at a single DRAM bank, it's a two-dimensional array of cells, columns and rows, and it's an abstraction. Also, internally, actually, there is even a lower level, but we don't need to go into that right now. Internally, a bank consists of many cells and other structures that enable access to the cells. But this is really my abstraction over here. Uh, in fact, internally, there are smaller arrays also, which we're not going to go into at this point. We may go into later. But if you look at uh, a DRAM chip internally, you have a row buffer, and the data first needs to be brought from a row into the row buffer so that you can read it. Initially, this row buffer is empty. Let's assume that. And let's assume, let's take a look at uh, how, how things are accessed. Let's assume that you're trying to access some address. Address is broken down to, into a row column. It's two dimensional essentially. You need to first activate the row, uh, supply the row address to the DRAM chip, and the DRAM chip essentially activates the row, which means that it brings the data in the entire row into this row buffer. That row can, can be like two kilobytes, eight kilobytes. We'll see that later on. Uh, now the data is in the row, uh, row buffer. Now you, uh, the, the memory controller can send the column address to get the data out of the row buffer. It basically sends the column address, zero, and the DRAM chip selects the right bytes out of this row buffer and multiplexes them out through the selector or multiplexer and sends to the memory controller. That's how you access row 0, activate row 0, and then read from column 0. Okay, this is good. That's the basic operation. Now we've gone a little bit le lower level. Right? Of course, we could go even more lower level and look at the exact structures of these, but it's not necessary in this case. right? You've seen how this multiplexer and how this decoder and how the cells are constructed in digital circuits, for example, but we're not going to go into that detail here. Uh, let's assume that the next axis is to row 0, column 1. Let's take a look at what happens. Row 0 is already in the row buffer. right? That's the realization. Meaning that the memory controller doesn't need to send row address again, because what's the point? The row is already there. The memory controller needs to only send the column address, and this phenomenon is called the row buffer hit, because the data that you're looking for is inside the row buffer, so it's a hit. So this is really a cache, essentially. It's really, we really cache the data from here to here. Okay, again, that's an abstraction level. We, you can call it a cache, but really the way it operates, it's really also not a cache. It really ha gives you a caching effect. Okay, so now the memory controller needs to send only the column address. Right? So this is a much faster request. You don't need to wait for the row address. Uh, you just send the column address, and the DRAM chip multiplexes out one of the data elements. 
Sounds good, right? Now let's take a look at the next address. Next ad address is to same row, column 85. You now you know the drill. Basically, it's again a row buffer hit. Row is already in the row buffer in the bank. And the memory controller sends a column address, and the DRAM chip sends out the appropriate column through the multiplexer. Now these two requests are much faster than this request. Now let's take a look at another request. This is to row 1, column 0. It could be from the same application or some other application. Doesn't matter. Now, the memory controller sees that row 0 is here. So it's not the data it wants. It wants it's looking for row 1. Now it needs to do an extra operation. In DRAM, it's called pre-charge, meaning writing back. This is called a row buffer conflict, first of all. Conflict in the sense that you're looking for some row, but some other row is present in this row buffer. So you need to resolve the conflict to, and get the right data. So how do you resolve the conflict? You pre-charge the array. Abstraction is writing back the row buffer back into the cells, but that's really an abstraction again, the way it really operates underneath, which you will see later on. This row buffer is a really fundamental component of DRAM. It's, there's no writing back. It, it's really a feedback loop that's formed between the row and the row buffer. And they, they basically, when, when a row buffer is activated, you have this continuous feedback loop. Anyway, you'll see that later on. Uh, now, uh, that's the first step. Now the row buffer is empty. Now we need to open row 1. So you need to send an activate command to row address 1. And the DRAM chip activates that row, brings the data into the row buffer. And then the memory controller can now send column address 0 finally after opening the appropriate row buffer, uh, appropriate row in the row buffer. And the DRAM chip sends column 0. So clearly this row conflict access took much longer, right? Than this row hit access. It took also much longer than the first access over here because the first access didn't need to write the row buffer pack, pre-charge the array, meaning prepare the array for the next access. Okay, so that's the realization. Now we realize something uh, different. Uh, basically, the, the row buffer behavior is different when you have hit, row buffer hits versus conflicts. Uh, row conflict memory access takes significantly longer than row hit access, and it turns out controllers that are designed for single core systems say, take advantage of this fact. What they do is they use a scheduling policy called first ready, first come, first serve. Uh, they basically prioritize row hit memory access. Assume that you have a queue of memory access that you're waiting to service. Uh, and which one do you select? One option is to select the oldest one, right? That's first come, first serve. That's really not scheduling in the end. That's what you take whatever comes first. I mean, it's a form of scheduling, but you're really not spending time to think about what you're doing. Uh, but in this case, uh, you're, you're explicitly trying to optimize for the uh, fact that the row buffer is acting as a cache and you're trying to minimize, m maximize the utilization that you get out of that row buffer, right? You were, you're trying to maximize the row buffer hits. That's the priority. So the accesses that hit in the row buffer are prioritized over others. Assuming all else is equal, you prioritize the older accesses over others. For example, if there are two accesses that hit in the row buffer, you pick the older one. That's the tie breaking. If there are no accesses that hit in the row buffer, then you pick the older one of the no accesses that hit in the row buffer. So this is a very simple policy. We're going to deconstruct that later on even more. This policy is actually reasonable. It, it tries to maximize DRAM throughput by make, taking advantage of the row, of the row buffer. It also minimizes the latencies actually by taking advantage of the row buffer. Uh, but unfortunately, there is a problem. Uh, the, the problem happens when you have multiple applications share the DRAM control. If you have a single thread, single application, it's not a problem for the most part. Although even there, there are some issues. Because memory controller, it turns out, it's a shared resource between a core as well as an I.O. device. So whenever you're accessing uh, the memory through a core, an I.O. device may be accessing memory also through the memory controller. So a similar issue exists in that case also. But it's much less of a problem because you're not running multiple applications at the same time. I.O. device all, not always constantly trying to access memory. But that is a problem as well, so keep that in mind. Uh, so, when, uh, so the problem is even worse when multiple applications share the DRAM controller. And DRAM controllers are designed to maximize DRAM data throughput, as we've seen. As a result of this policy, DRAM scheduling policies are unfair to some applications. So row hit, uh, and there are two types of unfairness. This row hit first, I've already given you the answer, otherwise I would ask you, but I would ask you how we solve the problem later on. Uh, row hit first unfairly prioritizes application with high row buffer locality. Imagine an application that always hits in the row buffer and you're employing a policy that's row hit first. Clearly you're prioritizing that application 
if some other application is not hitting in the robot, it's getting a lot of row conflicts, you're not prioritizing that. In fact, you're starving that application. And that's why this is unfair. But there's a, another aspect of unfairness in this policy. Even oldest first is unfair. Ignore this one. Well, hit first. You don't take advantage of the robot. You just do first come, first serve. You think this is a fair policy, but it's really not a fair policy. Uh, because if an application is memory intensive, it's generating lots of requests at the same time to memory. And another application is not memory intensive, it's generating, let's say, one request once in a while. So that poor request is getting delayed because this application floods the memory system, essentially. So even if you just have oldest first, you're unfair again. And this exacerbates the unfairness, throw hit first. Does that make sense? Any other unfairness issues in FRFCFS? It's a very simple policy, but... Okay. I don't think there's any, any other ones. Now this program becomes more complicated if you can start considering writes, reads, some other requests like prefetches. We, we haven't even talked about writes and reads. Those actually become more hairy because you need to handle writes and reads differently. Whenever you're writing into DRAM, you cannot read from DRAM, at least to this, from the same rank. So there's a problem over there. Meaning that if one application is extremely write intensive and another application is ex not so write intensive, you may have a similar issue over here. So the problem is actually much more complicated than uh, what, I, what I'm describing here. But this is really the fundamental part of this policy. Okay, so as a result of this unfairness, uh, the memory control is really vulnerable to denial of service attacks. Uh, so you can actually write programs to exploit this unfairness. If you know that you're running your program on a cloud and for whatever reason, you want to be malicious, just write a program that prioritizes itself knowing this policy. Right? Now maybe the attack surface is not, maybe you cannot steal stuff with this, but later actually people showed that uh, you can time how often you're getting robo for hits and robo for conflicts. So you can write an application that could evict uh, rows from some other application that you're running together with, and it can time how often it's getting row buffer hits and misses, so you can guess which rows are being accessed by that application. And based on that, you can infer some secret keys. It's fascinating. I'd recommend you to take a look at it. Maybe I'll reference that paper. Uh, maybe John. Uh, yes? Problem with virtual memory and... Not yeah, all of them, uh, people are able to solve those. <laughs> yeah. That's true for, I mean, you, you have all of those problems with Spectre and Meltdown and everything, right? Rowhammer as well, basically. All of those layers, basically, a good hacker can break those. <laughs> but uh, So this could be some other security problem in some other way. Basically. The fact uh, that th there the problem is really fundamentally interference. Because you're, you're able to predictably cause interference to some other application that you're running together with, you can induce these robo for conflicts in that application. And based on the patterns of robo for conflicts that you're getting, you can guess which parts of memory that application is accessing, and based on that information, you can guess what is the secret key that is manipulating. Of course, there's a lot that's involved in this attack, but people have shown that this, uh, these attacks are probabilistically possible. Just like Spectre and Meltdown are probabilistically possible. Okay, so that's a different type of attack that's caused by the same fundamental interference problem. In this case, the attack is less severe in the sense that you have a performance attack. It's a denial of service attack. You can write a program to exploit unfairness. And this is the program that we wrote to exploit that unfairness, basically, in the paper that we uh, published in 2007. This is a streaming application. Essentially, it's very simple. As you can see, it's copying one array to another array, large array. And it's doing this in a streaming manner. Basically, it's going through elements sequence by sequence. And we ensure that every element accesses a cache miss. You're always going to memory by making the size of the index or element the same size of the cache line, cache block so that you're never getting hash cache hits. So you can see that this very sequential memory access, very high robo for locality, and very memory intensive. Basically, every access to cache miss over here. Okay, so this is the per performance hog. Whenever you do studies, scientific studies, it's always good to have a control application. And whenever you want to construct a control application, you want, to be, you want it to be as similar to this as possible. And that's essentially what we did. We also want, created this random access application uh, essentially, it does the, exactly the same thing. Copies this array to this other array. But it doesn't do it in sequence order. 
it does it in a random order. It selects the indices randomly to copy. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. Of course, when you want to do the study, you cannot do it exactly like what I described. This is, this is also an abstraction this, of, of the code that we really write. Because if you do the study the way I just described over here, you'll find that this is much, 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 much slower compared to this one. Can anybody guess why? Yes? Exactly. You have a random function call, right? And this one clearly doesn't have that random function call. And this random function call actually takes a long time because random number generation is not easy in, in these systems. So basically, if you really want to do the study, you do it differently. And the, the way it's done differently is you pre-generate the indices earlier. And you have an index array also that you need to access such that this thing takes the same amount of time this, as this thing over here. And you can do that. Uh, and then you time it, of course, starting from the beginning of the for loop to the end of the for loop. Okay, that's some experimental methodology <laughs> for you. But basically, if you do it right, uh, this has random memory access, very low over for locality, and it becomes similarly memory intensive. If you don't do it right, it's not similarly memory intensive. It's very compute intensive over here. Memory is still a bottleneck, but not as, not as similar as this one. But if you do it right, then it's almost exactly the same in terms of memory intensity. You can read the paper. Uh, basically, I think we get something like maybe 600 misses per thousand instructions. Uh, in these two when we run our real systems. Okay, so this is the control application. You can see that they only differ in terms of the row buffer hit rate over here. Everything else, all of the other operations are the same. So let's take a look at what happens when these two applications are run together. Uh, the, the blue one is the streaming application, T0. The red one is the random access application. And this is the memory request buffer. I'm going to focus on only one bank over here. And remember, they're similarly memory intensive. So all this first policy is not a problem here. We're, we're trying to test the row buffer hit uh, prioritization and its effect. Uh, so let's say uh, the row 0 is open initially and streaming application accesses row 0. It's a row buffer hit. And then the random access application generates requests. Streaming application also generates requests at the same rate, let's say. And the expectation in the common case, or always the expectation, assuming everything is regular, the expectation is that you have requests from both applications. And the request from the streaming application goes to row 0. Request from random access application goes to random rows. And as a result, what does the underlying scheduler do, the scheduler picks the, app, uh, picks the request that hits in the row buffer because it's employing the row buffer hit first policy. So it picks a streaming application's request, which means that it's delaying this application, right, clearly. And this application keeps generating other requests. Streaming application still keeps generating requests and the memory controller keeps picking the streaming application's request, as you can see. And this will go on for a while until the streaming application stops generating requests to row zero. Yes? Um, does the memory request buffer know that they I see. So uh, in this case, no. Basically, there is no information about which application a request is coming from. If you had that information, yes, you could do a lot of things. And that's one of the solution directions to examine. But the system that we, ever, we were examining had no information. Literally, they put two cores and kept the memory controller exactly the same as it would be in a single core. And that's it. <laughs> and that is part of the problem. And the solution, as we will see, well, there could be multiple solutions we will discuss, but one of the solutions is making the request buffer aware of the different applications and doing something more fair. Okay, so you can see we could go on forever like this. <laughs> and essentially, random access application is starving. And you can do the calculations, assuming that the memory controller uh, behaves just like we discussed. If you have a row size of 8 kilobytes, which is reasonable, and a cache block size of 64 bytes, which is also reasonable, you have 128 requests of streaming application service before a single request of random access application. And again, this is not the worst attack. You can make an attack even worse, right? Assuming that the memory controller always prioritizes row hit requests without stopping that prioritization, you could go back and keep accessing this row again and again and again and again somehow, right? 
You could make that row uncacheable completely so that it doesn't get cached in the caches. So you can always access that row. Now the life is not as bad because memory controllers usually have a, also have a hard cutoff saying that if, uh, if I haven't serviced a request for some number of cycles, let's say n number of cycles, I'm going to service that. So that's one way of solving the problem. It's not a good solution because they're very hard cut off, right? That still prioritizes the application that's doing very heavy uh, intensity. It's not completely fair, basically. And also, how do you determine that cutoff, right? Is it 10,000 cycles? Is it 10 million cycles? Is it 300 cycles? Because if you do it too early, then you don't take advantage of the robot for locality. So we're going to talk about some of these solutions. It's, it's really fascinating. And this sort of thing happens in all types of memory. It happens in SSDs. It happens in main memory. This is the first work that exposed in main memory. But SSDs are also very interesting. It happens in caches also, but caches are a little bit uh, less problematic, although as we have larger and larger caches, they'll also become even more problematic going forward. But at least the smaller caches, they're fast. You can access them fast, so the latencies are not as bad. But the same fairness issue happens in the caches also. Okay, so this is one example demonstrating why uh, the problem happens. Now, of course, now we understand why the problem happens. There are two reasons. Well, there's one fundamental reason. Memory controller uh, is uh, prioritizing is, is unfair. It's prioritizing for DRAM throughput, memory throughput, or memory latency. And it's, it doesn't consider unfairness. But there are two reasons why it doesn't consider. Oldest first policy is unfair, fundamentally. And also, a row hit first policy is unfair, fundamentally. Oldest first is unfair because memory intensive applications are, uh, if, if you're generating a lot of requests, uh, Naturally, m many of your requests are older compared to other requests or of some other application that doesn't generate a lot of requests, right? Row hit first is unfair for the reason just we, we just saw. So let's talk about solutions. This is a place maybe you can generate some ideas. Yes? I see. Okay, that's, I like that idea. So basically what you suggest is a form of batching. Yes. You have this batch of requests and you have to complete them before you move to the next batch or next window. And regardless of whether or not row buffer hits or conflicts. And within the window you have some prioritization policy. Let's assume you still want to take advantage of the row buffer hit, hits. I like that. That's part of one, one of our solutions to the problem. Now that will alleviate the problem. Is it the most fair thing? Theoretically, is that the most fair thing? I don't know. <laughs> but that does alleviate the problem, actually. Any other thoughts? Yes? I think the obvious one would be telling actually the memory manager that there are different applications and that it needs to prioritize both of them equally. <coughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's certainly one way. I think uh, her solution could be combined with that also, actually. Uh, yeah. One way is actually batching without being aware of the threads, but a better way is, is actually batching while being aware of the threads. I agree with that. Then the question is basically, how, uh, how do you do it fairly? There, there's, a <laughs> there's a devil in that sentence. <laughs> and fairness is always a problem, actually, whenever you talk about fairness in any... This is also very fundamental. Whenever you talk about fairness in any, uh, any place, in human life also, there's always a definition of fairness, what is fair and what is not. Yes, please. I don't know if it would be possible to have separate controllers for the two cores. Okay. But, um, there would be some kind of scheduling per controller. So. Okay, then you don't get into this problem, basically. Each, each core goes to a different controller. I think that's, uh, that's reasonable, except, and we will, uh, we, be, we will talk about solutions like this. Uh, the problem is it's not scalable to have as many controllers as the number of cores. So you'll run into this problem in, in each individual controller in the end. But uh, I think the, the, the direction of your idea is good in the sense that maybe if you have multiple controllers, you can alleviate the problem. In the sense that in some controllers, you, 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 you direct the requests of applications that are interfering badly to different controllers. Because not, not all interference is as bad. So if applications are similar to each other, let's say, 
they have similar row buffer hit rates, and they have similar intensities, maybe the problem is not as bad. Actually, that's what our results show. Yes? Maybe the operating system could notice that this is happening mm -hmm. uh, based on the slowdown, for example. OK. It's just uh, like slow down the, the MATLAB application, or even have like a memory priority that you can set. OK. Uh, I like the memory priority. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I will ask a similar question that I asked him. How do you determine the slowdown? You'd have to execute first the applications uh, on a single core, I mm -hmm. guess, or have a da database of, of popular applications okay. to keep the, the yeah. usual speed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these are all interesting ideas, and I, uh, they're, they're all proposed in some way or form. <laughs> The, the, the downside, of course, is overheads that you get. Uh, if you have a list of popular applications, and if, you, if, if that database can provide you the baseline performance, I think that's a very good approach. The question is how representative your database is in, in many cases. It's possible, I think. But we will see later that you could actually uh, estimate some of these slowdowns in hardware also. So your, your approach is actually... Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. I think it's... Uh, 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 the, the, the way you describe your idea is good, uh, except there, uh, how do you actually uh, guess the slowdowns uh, is, is still an open question, I think. Yes? In the follow up, would be that actually, maybe on the hardware side, you have a counter. How long has it passed in cycle perhaps since the last time a request from this core has been served? Okay. In that way, you can estimate, okay, this core hasn't had a request for a long time, mm -hmm. and maybe it's time to service this core. Okay, that's, that's also good. I mean, all of the, these ideas, you guys are generating good ideas. Good. Uh, basically, a lot of these are actually proposed in some way or shape or form. Uh, that's actually employed. Uh, what you suggest is uh, called least attained service scheduling. Basically, you keep track of how much service each core has attained, and you try to prioritize the core that has attained the, service, uh, the least service so far. And we have, we have a paper related to that. Of course, the, the key question is how do you actually do it? But, uh, but the basic idea is there. Actually, some operating system schedulers at the operating system level uh, use that idea because similar issue exists in the operating system, right? The operating system tries to schedule between multiple applications to a core. Which one do you select? If you select one that has uh, been selected too much, then it has attained service a lot. So you select the ones that has attained service less. Yes. Uh, I have a question about like, so if we ever like database or index or like identify these different programs by like their their base runtimes, mm -hmm. um, is that vulnerable to like <laughs> other programs like imitating other programs to like exploit and get more share of like the shared resources or anything like that? Basically, can you uh, you, you mean you can fake the data in the database? Yeah, this big database that we see like this program. Mm -hmm. uh, like it's typically like this slowdown, so therefore like this one should actually more. Oh, I see. Share. Could any program be like, oh, uh, I'm like I'm I see. Call myself this program. Yeah, I see, I see, I see. Basically, you can fake, you can you can use a fake slowdown, uh, baseline slowdown, to inflate your real slowdown, yeah. right? A baseline performs to inflate your. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it's certainly. Uh, I haven't thought about that solution as much, but uh, these are thing, these are issues that you need to think about if you go go down a particular path of solution for sure. Yeah, that, that, I think that, that goes back to the representativeness of the baseline performance of an application. Okay, any other thoughts? Yes? Can we randomly access the, the memories according to if they are less, like, proportional to the performance? Let's say mm -hmm. if it's the uh, same role, we have higher pro probability to, it, to enter this request and if it's a, uh, so that, that we also have fairness. No, I see. Basically, you're suggesting adding some randomization, yeah. uh, such that you don't do it as strictly, but based on some value. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's also possible. It's, I like these sort of randomized uh, processes that could help uh, fairness. I think people have shown also that randomi uh, uh, randomized processes can help fairness based on some weight. Usually, the, the question is how do you determine the weights? Because one application needs to, like, do you do it 50-50? Do you do it 60-40? Or do you do it based on some other metric? 
But these sort of ideas have also been explored uh, in the context of operating system scheduling, for example. If you know the work called lottery scheduling, it's an operating system scheduler that was proposed essentially uh, with that same basic idea. You can search for it. The uh, Carl Waltzberger's thesis is on this topic, lottery scheduling. Maybe we'll cover it at some point in this course. Even though it's not the subject of this course, I really like that uh, direction. And a lot of the ideas, again, as I said, it's very fundamental. It may be done at the operating system level, but it could be applicable to the lower level as well. Yes? I mean, if you just really want both uh, cores to have the same speed, you could maybe base it on the wait time. Like mm -hmm. How long has it been blocked on a, uh, on a memory access? Mm -hmm. and if you see that one uh, process is taking longer, then you start flushing the other mm -hmm. or deprioritizing yeah, the right. other memory accesses and always like le like a thermostat going up sure. and down <laughs> and until you find like yeah yeah a way in between something. Yeah yeah definitely. I think that's another solution uh, similar to what we proposed. Uh, certainly, trying to balance the slowdowns, right? Somehow keeping into account, taking into account. Do, do some accounting to figure out how much uh, imbalance there is and keep the balance, like, the, like a thermostat, as you said. Okay, these are all very good ideas, but now we're running out of time. <laughs> so keep generating ideas. I think I'd like to uh, keep the spirit in this class so that you can think about new ideas. Some of them are actually new. Some combinations may be new also. And feel free to talk to each other as well if you're interested in these topics. Uh, but let me cover this because we're almost done with this lecture. Uh, so what is the right place to solve the problem? And I think I've heard ideas from different places. Programmer? Hmm. Nobody. I heard, no, I heard no programmer ideas. Because this is really not a programmer's problem, right? It's actually a programmer's problem, but it's not a problem that can be solved by the programmer. <laughs> because programmer programmed this particular application and some other random application is interfering with it. So it's not a, a solution that can be done at the programming level or at the compiler level, I believe. Of course, actually, uh, many compiler optimizations try to optimize for locality. Uh, so they actually create these performance hogs, potentially. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that this is a problem that's caused by compilers. Hardware, I've seen some ideas like that. Can you do it inside the DRAM? Can you do it inside the circuits? I think this is some food for thought. I'm not sure if this is the right level of abstraction. Can you add something into the uh, circuits, for example, to minimize this effect? I don't know. Get rid of the robuffer maybe somehow. But that's very fundamental also. All memories have some sort of buffering structure because you cannot directly read from the array. Or you need to buffer what you read from the array uh, to amplify the signal. Because what you have in the array is a very low uh, signal. Okay, basically I, I will finish uh, with this one. There are two other goals of this course. Uh, hopefully you will think critically. And I think what we're doing right now is an example of that, basically. Hopefully, we'll think critically about why is this happening? Should it really happen? How do we solve the problem? Is this the right solution? Is this the right place to do the solution? Or is this a good problem to actually solve to begin with, right? All of these we covered at some level. And broadly also, because I don't want to restrict uh, your thinking to a particular type of solution. Whenever you see a solution, it's good to think about the broader aspects. Can you actually solve the problem in some other level? Or cooperatively between multiple levels, right? Some of you uh, provided the idea of putting the priorities inside the hardware, for example. That, I think, is a very good idea, and that's already starting to happen. But that wasn't happening when we were writing these papers, basically. Finally, things are moving, so you have to be patient as an architect. Okay, so this is the paper uh, that I described briefly. Uh, and this may be actually one of the optional readings for your homework one assignment or pot potential readings. Basically, we will have some paper reviews in this course. Hopefully, you'll enjoy doing some of them. I haven't decided which ones yet, but this could be one. But you can read it on your own also. By the way, Thomas was my uh, mm, collaborator for a long time, and he's an ETH alumnus also. He did his PhD uh, over, over here. Uh, okay, and if you're interested, there's further engaging also. So let me finish with this takeaway. Basically, uh, I think breaking the abstraction layers between different components and the transformation arc levels and knowing what's underneath really enables you to understand and solve the problems. I think we've done a deep dive into one example of this. Tomorrow we will do some other deep dives. Any questions? Okay. So I guess I'll see you tomorrow then.